Hello, hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Just had to check and make sure it was actually afternoon. I am incredibly, incredibly, incredibly running behind. But such is life. How is everyone? How is everyone doing? Hi, Feminist Critique Pod. Good to see you. Look at me. I got some fucking Baja Blast. I got me some delicious bubbly water. I am ready to go. Believe it or not, I actually, both Zanzi and I, both of us misscheduled. Um, but we figured it out, and we will be talking in just under five minutes. So soon, you will have a really interesting discussion between myself and Zanzi. Look, I'm even sporting the tank top today. Bam. By the way, this used to be my favorite soda, Baja Blast. Not anymore. Triple cola all the way. Actually, that's something we can find out together. I wanted to do a little bit of research, so let's find out. Let's find out. <gasps> you can! They have them! Um, let's see. I'm trying to see if you can buy them online. Our products. Triple Cola. Where is it? Give me my fucking Triple Cola. Hey! Hey, MD Nelson. Good to see you. Hi, Flowery Jane. Lynn, good to see you. Damn, look at all my fucking favorite people in chat today. Um, ah, there we go. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I'm glad. Oh yeah, we have new point redemptions. You can, let's see, you can get me to, to dab. Nobody did it, so I didn't do a full dab. You can have me scream randomly. You can activate on-screen emotes for the stream. Um, and you could also, if you want to go, if you want to be a high roller, you can spend 100,000 and I will do the longest re I can manage at the time. <laughs> hey, Marinara. Hey, that's okay. I hope you have a really nice drive. Stay safe. I would prefer to have you listen and drive safely than try to text while driving. That would not be good. Let's see. Oh. Do they have them? Uh-oh. Oh, you can only order. This is so dumb. It looks like you can... I was I was thinking about trying to buy some of this stuff directly because I love this soda so, so much. But as it turns out, you can only wholesale them, which means I'd need to buy like a pallet. And that just doesn't seem reasonable. You know, that just doesn't seem reasonable. Um, okay, so what are we going to talk about today? We are going to be talking with Zanzi about my debate style, which he calls... How not to be an asshole. I think I'm sometimes an asshole. But, you know, yeah, I could split a pallet. Yeah, I got to split a pallet. I've got to get a whole bunch of people together and, like, split a whole pallet. of Triple cola is, like, it's that good. It's so good that I've thought about it. Also, um, they only ever order, like, 12 at a time at my local grocery store. So every time I go there, I end up buying out the whole thing. And then it takes them, like, fucking weeks to get more. Why wouldn't they order more? Also, keep in mind, they have a whole wall of these sodas, of these, like, special, unique, like, local sodas. And the only one that ever sells out completely is the triple cola, the one I like. So every single week, a bunch of people descend in and grab as much as they can, and then it's gone. And all the other sodas just sit there because they're not as good. Shame. Of course. Triple cola is the best. It is by far the best cola I've ever had. I don't know what they put in it, but it's way, way better it's, it's real cane sugar and they have like some other flavorings in it. It just really pops. It's super refreshing, especially over ice. Yes. I am very particular about my sodas. I'm a soda addict as it turns out. Um, but it's all right. We all have our vices, right? So today we are talking about my style. And then after that, we are going to go into a big debunk of Chaz Chop stuff because a very good friend, friend of the show, Gina Ragnos, um, sent me a really, really galling propaganda video about Chaz Chop. And we're going to tear 
the shit out of it because it made me so mad watching it last night that I did. Ready? Here you go. Hold on. I'm going to show you guys a preview. Get ready. You get a quick preview. So you better all be anybody who can watch. You better be watching. Watch this. Ready? Oh, shit. Did you see all those notes? Holy shit. Look at all those notes. Look at that. So much notes. I actually, I, I literally did ADHD brain me did a, a whole outline of notes on this fucking video. That's how mad it made me. So we'll be talking about that right now. We're just waiting for Zanzi. Zanzi should be back any moment and then we'll be able to start talking. Oh, here we go. Alrighty. Let's start the video call. Give me just a second here. It'll be just a second while I work out the, uh, let's go full screen. Boop. Hello. Hey, hello. Let me see if I can get, here we go. Well, wait a second. I want you big and me small, and then I can have my, aha, now we have it. Oh no, but now people I can't see. Me. Hey, you're looking great. I love your, oh, what is that a cute thing. little bee? You have a bee friend in the background. Oh, it's, it's, what's, Jesus, this is actually really cute. <laughs> it is so cute. It's a friend. I know what this is. It says bumbleints. Um, it's something that my mom, she done. Uh, she does a lot of quilting and things like that. She made a whole lot of like quilts and kind of like little soft toys. Um, it's an ambulance, but they kind of like dress it up and make it less scary for children. So it's Aww. called bumbleints. Oh, that's, uh, that's cute. Adorable. That is cute. Oh, so, let's uh, see. I, I got to move my chat up real quick. Give me. Wait a second. How am I going to do this? Hold on. I need to. Let's see. No, I, uh, hmm. 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 Ah, well. All right, well, you know what? Chat is just going to have to go off for the duration of this interview because that white shirt, unfortunately, makes chat invisible. But I can't blame oh. you because I'm also wearing white, so... And my skin is also extremely pale at the moment, so... Um, it's it's always the tiniest. It's the smallest of things. Oh, sorry, like, um... No. I, I had no intention of wearing white, but um, like this T-shirt for whatever reason, it's 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 very white, so it like collected all of the stains that I've amassed over the entirety of my like three weeks of owning it, and I just decided all of these stains are not going to come out. I washed <laughs> it like eight or nine different times, and it just like decided like this is your life now. You're stuck with this. So like I did what every like just like. Uh, suburban white boy does and I came back to my mother and said mom will you take out the stains for me and I tell you <laughs> she's a miracle worker she did yeah there's you, there's 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 secret mom magic it's just how it works you gotta mm. know it um uh, the the secret was using like vanisher detergent or something it's like something I wouldn't have known super strong yeah I, I I find I found that uh fucking like a, a good vinegar mixture even though it will make the clothes smell bad for like two washes will get it out you just have to wash it multiple mm. times afterwards but yeah, sometimes you need something more extreme even than that. Let me just um, let me just play with your audio real quick because you're a little soft on my end. Hold on. Um, how do, no, it, it's on my end. It's, it's definitely on my okay. end. Okay. Uh, do you want to talk? Uh, just on my end. Let me know if everything's fine. Sorry, I'll, I'll be quiet now. No, you're good. No, no, I was I was actually hoping you'd keep talking so I could check the levels. You want to give me okay, a test, I'll test, test. Uh, test, test, test. All right. How's that chat? Can you all hear? Can my chat hear on Z fine? I'm gonna boost up the audio a little bit all right this should be good Send. i think we'll be a, yeah perfect all right good i'm getting good reports here yeah i, I think we're fine on my end as well chat's not Excellent. telling me anything that's good actually i'm gonna move my my camera up so it covers this there we go perfect hey look now it looks super polished amazing all right cool so yeah let's talk uh-oh i gotta do a dab boink there you go <laughs> Yeah, I added I added a whole bunch of new commands. Um, one of which be that people can can add like uh, they can spend their points on. One of which is make me dab, which is one of the default ones, and then I made my own, which is make me scream randomly, <laughs> which I'm probably going to have to to uh, disable during interviews and shit and and conversations yeah. with other people. Else, I'll make them very angry. <laughs> Or, be, or be known as the guest that, uh, or be known as the host that kind of just goes like, one second. Yep, so that's... tell me about children in Darfur. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> Very serious topic. Um, yeah. Fun fact, actually, about Darfur. Um, my church 
before the Coney tw- 2012 thing. That was Coney 2012, right? Was the I think so, yes. Sudan, uh, Southern Sudan, Darfur thing. Um, th- my church was super, super involved in that region. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, no joke. Like my church literally built like an armed compound uh, in Southern Darfur, uh, in, uh, in Darfur, um, specifically to like, uh, basically run like a, uh, an armed, um, like basically just a shelter that people could go mm. to at night. Um, but yeah, it gets that, that part on the surface is like, Oh, that's kind of cool. Like, you know, they went in and made like a safe compound. It, it of course gets messier from there, but nonetheless, random, interesting thing. So look at that. We went from dabbing to Darfur, unironically. And and the last thing before I get into it, just it's the smallest of things that I find hilarious. The way the Discord is said, at least on my end anyway, it looks like we're both sat across each other at a table with like professional boom mics sat in the middle. It's just kind of like, like, thanks for coming into the studio today. So yeah, yeah. I love it. It's brilliant. Uh, yeah, it looks this good. so rarely happens. <laughs> hey, it's really, it works out really well because you, you use a mm. similar angle to me, like where it's like you have chat on the side and I have chat on the side. It works yeah. out perfect. I like it. It gives us, gives some uh, old, old school radio feels. Oh yeah. Cause, cause yeah. it's uh, like the last thing I'll say before we get into it. Like I find, I'll say the word claustrophobe because I just don't know a better way of describing it. Like staring straight into the camera. This just, I feel like I'm staring into somebody's soul. Whereas if I look kind of to the left of me every now and then looks at him, because it's like, like, this is the way I say it to people. If you're sitting down talking to your friends and there's a group of you, because that's what Twitch streaming is, you're talking to a group of people, you're never sat st- staring and boring your eyes into the entire group. No, that's not how that works. I mean, unless you're it's like, just... like a, like a old Testament style, like Seraphim and like your eyes on all side of your heads, no matter who's looking at you, everyone will be looking directly into your eyes. But I do agree do, with do, you. Do. Yeah, I do agree do, with you. Do, does my circling flaming wings look up? <laughs> yeah, looking great. Um, yeah, it is a little weird. Uh, for at least this seems like the minutia of streaming, but it is weird to me um, when like people put a straight on angle and they're looking straight at mm. me. But I know there's a, like a dissonance in your mind of like, wait a second. Like I know they're talking to an audience, but it feels mm. like they're staring right at me. Yeah, so you're a hundred percent right about that. Um, and it's just. It's literally, it's, for me, I know for me, it's just an anxiety thing because I hate it when people are just staring at me because that means either one of two things. They're interested in what you're saying, so you know how to kind of like keep that interest <laughs> or they don't like what you're saying, so you have to stop talking. And how do you hold those two thoughts simultaneously at the same time? Difficult. It's, it's Difficultly. <laughs> Yeah. So it's uh, but but anyway, my how how are you doing today? How are you doing? I'm doing friend? great. It's um incredibly hot here right now. Um, so I have two beverages today. I was telling my chat about. I have a Baja Blast and some sparkling water. Um, the degenerate oh. the degenerate drink, as we all know, sparkling water. <laughs> um, but uh, I love sparkling water. But yeah, it's been really hot. <laughs> like last night was so fucking miserable. Um and god i've been like running around all morning and but now i'm like feeling good so and mm. and my room has finally dropped in temperature so that's nice that's nice because it's mm. um the uh, the irish in the uk we often get made fun of over in the states because the weather doesn't get that hot but we're a nation that has like no ac so if it gets even like vaguely uncomfortably hot we there's nothing we can do about it we yep. just gotta deal with it same literally um, like, the exact same thing about the pacific northwest here in the pacific mm. northwest no one except for really rich people have ac and even then mm. usually they have to like when they buy their house they'll have to pers- like install it themselves no one has ac up here so it's just like we almost always will get like a string of days in the summer that are just incredibly hot and then everybody dies. And then we all go go from there. But again, also, I, I have, like, low heat resist. Okay, I have, like, low heat resistance because I grew up in... Um, I grew up in the, the, the northernmost state in the United States minus Alaska. Um, yeah. And so, like, that is, like, a... It's basically Canada. Like, it, it's, like, very, very cold most of the year. We have warm summers, but they're pretty mild. Um, hmm. And it's a coastal uh, state. So I'm like, I'm used to the cold. When it's cold, I'm happy. I'm like, oh, yeah, I got my blanket. I can, like, you know, get all snuggly. But in the summer, I'm just like, kill me. 
It's so. the exact same as me. It's like if I ever left Ireland, there's two places I'm looking at moving. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of like uh, Western Canada or like the North Island in New Zealand, just because they're climates I'm used to, but they get more snow. And because it, it, it here's a weird thing about me. Wherever I am, it doesn't snow. Hmm. Uh, it, it's just I don't know how that works. Uh, last year, no, two years ago, <clears throat> Ireland got like blanketed under a blanket of snow where I was watching like news bulletins about people were having to like get out plows to dig themselves out of the snow. I looked out my bedroom window and it was just like a lovely sunny day. I don't know what it is. Just wherever I am, there's no snow. Hey, some governments would pay big money for that. You might have some, you might, you might better, you better be careful about broadcasting that mutant ability. It's going to end up being like X-Men. I I, I fucking knew they were real. Yeah, uh, snow, damn. Yeah, I lived in, like, snowy tundra my whole life, so snow is, like, mm. part of my life. But, yeah, hey, if you ever come to, if you end up going to Western Canada, that's, like, hella close to where I am. So maybe we can hang out someday. If, if that is, if the United States ever comes out of global quarantine. At this rate, I'm pretty sure that we're just going to become, like, a, a diseased waste. Like, we're going to be, like, the toxic level in, like, in, like, Sonic or Mario. Like, you know how there's yeah. always, like, the toxic level? That's going to be the United States. And and the the one aspect like the, the last thing when we get into the topic like the last thing that's be going to be that's going to become more and more relevant with time going on, it's the beginning of hurricane season, mm-hmm. and Florida is one of the worst affected states. It's oh, going yeah. to get a it's lot worse be before good. it gets better. Yeah, Florida yeah. is. Uh... Oh boy! Yeah, we we've yeah. talked about Florida on this channel a couple times. Yeah, yeah, we seriously. Somebody in my chat says somebody call Captain Planet. Unironically, <laughs> if you got his number, somebody give him a fucking call. <laughs> Uh, yeah. hold on a second. Hold on a second. Give me just a second. Ah! There we go. Somebody there. I, did, I hope that didn't go through on your end. I had to mute the mic while I screamed for somebody who redeemed their points. <laughs> it didn't go through my end. No, it, it looked like you just done a face, and I thought you were like preparing for a gift or something. No, I was like. So, all right the, uh, all right all right. Everybody, from now on, though, I can't yell during interviews. So. so. I'm sorry. This is a total derailing of the entire conversation. I'm very sorry. Somebody said, oh, no, what's going on? I just clicked this thing that popped up. I'm so, so sorry. <laughs> this is what I had in it. All right. Sick. I all right. It. Let's. let's <sighs> all right. We'll do the talk. Let's do the talk now. Oh, yeah. well, it's, um, the, it, it actually perfectly sets up but how I was going to finish it off with the idea that I do consider right now Florida to be the compassion test. <clears throat> because anybody who's very left leaning knows that most of the problems in Florida right now are because of successive kind of Republican governments yep. and a lot of kind of like upper one percenters who kind of move there for their holiday homes. So a lot of their problems are of their own device and their own making. Yep. But there's a lot of people who are suffering. So I often describe it as kind of it's the compassion test. It's uh, like we hate them, but they're people. And it's it's yeah. it's dealing with that dissonance that can be difficult. I actually lived in Florida for a while. Um, I used to spend every summer in Florida for like six years, seven years of my life because um, my dad lived there. And Florida, I can tell you, is a very strange place um, because there are a lot of people, specifically in northern Florida, who've like there are whole, like it's like generations of people who've lived in Florida. But then you have like the big urban centers like Miami and Fort Lauderdale, Fort Lauderdale, especially. Um, and some of the West coast cities that are like the West coast cities are like super bougie in like this very Mm -hmm. specific, like way where like all the houses are like, they're like Floridian McMansions, basically. It's really weird. So like Fort Lauderdale, I swear to God is a city of condominiums. The entire town is all condos. And so it's like, half the people don't even live there the whole year. And it's like, and yet they've been, they they often vote there because that's where their most valuable yeah. property is. So it's so messed up. It's such a complicated issue. And yeah, I don't, uh, I don't think that like uh, the, the, the chank approach to dealing with Southern states is a good one at all. Um, yeah. yeah, but sometimes it's like with Florida, I'm just like, I don't know what to do except for say, Florida is so fucked. I don't even know what the response is. Like, holy shit, it's yeah. going to suck. There's going to, like, I like I feel bad for, I know a couple of streamers who live in Florida. I know that Xander Hall just got out of Florida, I think, too. Yeah. Um, and I think, 
I think Synth might live there. I don't remember. There's a couple of people who live in Florida, and I feel bad for all of them because I can't imagine. Yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah I can't imagine dealing with that level of like um, systemic inability to 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 move or adapt at all. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's exactly because like the the. I was about to say the political will is there, but it's there amongst kind of like the actual people who live there. But I, when you get into like local government, it's just they're stubborn. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I think they call um. I think the nickname that's been coming for Ron DeSantis, the governor, is uh is is Ron Death Santis, and uh, hmm. yeah, I've seen literal posters of of like him with like a skull superimposed over his face, and it's just like Ron Death Santis because uh, it is like their their state government is is like hyper hyper conservative, and yeah, hmm. even if there's some of their local ones aren't. Anyway, that's a totally side issue but it's an interesting oh, yeah. one i guess because a, a beautiful segue is <clears throat> um mad uh, maddox just popped into my chat kind of saying uh hey how not to be an asshole that's you so what's going on here so <laughs> so we can beautifully introduce it to our um i i got in touch with demon mom because i wanted to talk to you about this topic because um it, how i literally got introduced to you was being invited onto um a chud night panel and two of the things that I remember from that night was I gave some pretty salient takes and why landlords are evil. But like saying kill on landlords doesn't give people houses. We have to actually find ways of giving people houses. And the second thing was how you were very able to aggressively make your point, but make it in a way that still respected people's humanity. And and I took that away with me. And then I've watched you on more and more panels. And it, it, that wasn't a fluke. It's something you consistently do. So basically, I just good. reach out to you and say, hey, can you teach me how to not be an asshole? Because um, I want to get more involved in debating because Hell it's yeah. just like, it, I'm sure there's loads of people in our chats who will agree with me here. Where it's, Have you ever just been sat down and you're listening to conversations? You're just holding your head going, oh, for the love of God, I can make this point better. Um, yes. But then it's, it's when... <laughs> It's when you get into the thick of it. Um, I, I'm salient enough and I'm, I'm aware enough of myself to know it's never that easy. So I'm doing yeah. my due diligence now to ask around and say, hey, what's your experience of debating? Yeah. Um, well, uh, I mean, again, I always I keep saying I don't always think I'm not always an asshole. I think there's probably some people who think <laughs> I'm an asshole. I think I'm an asshole sometimes. But I will I do I will say that one of my one of my biggest things that I try to focus on is I don't want to be, I never want to be the asshole on the panel. Um, like, mm. and I don't actually know if there's really like, this is specifically talking about panels, but uh, this can occur in one-on-one -on -one debate as well. Um, and in fact, I mean, I don't know. I've had some, I've had some pretty spicy one-on-one -on -one debates. I think I literally said to like Dario, for example, I think I literally said to, his face that he's the most insufferable person that I ever talked to. And perhaps that was one of the meaner things that I've ever said. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, so sometimes even I lose my cool, but um, I think it's important, you know, to remember, like, at least for me, one of the things I'm always doing is I'm always, I'm always thinking about how it's like, it's not just my opponent um, or my audience that I'm talking to. It's also, my opponent's audience and the audience of anybody else, like on a panel, especially their audience as well. Um, and I think that changes like how I approach like a lot of my rhetoric, um, you know, cause it's like, Hey, like, for example, there are certain types of jokes that I can make to my audience and, um, and they'll, it'll sail really well. Or there are certain arguments I'll make to my audience that'll sail really well. Um, and sometimes if you watch my streams during a panel, I will occasionally make a comment off mic that's directed at my audience specifically. It's like, ah, oh, yeah, okay, sure. You know what I mean? But I won't, but I think that, that, that ability to like, Hey, like this is something I'm setting towards my audience that I'm not like, that isn't li that literally isn't designed to be like an argument or anything, but this is more for my audience. Mm. I think keeping that like those spaces sort of s distinct is really important at least in how i approach it because like i think it's one like one thing you'll notice a lot like you know not to ramble too much but one thing i've noticed a lot on panels and on debates is like people will um that people love to make si like little side comments um and 
if I'm ever going to make like a like a like a side comment or like a like a like a quick retort like oh yeah okay like something sarcastic like that it's got to be really good and that's an inter like a personal rule for myself like if i'm going to interrupt somebody i've done it before like i've i've interrupted people and been like of course you'd think that you know what i mean and i've also like i mean in one of my recent debates i think i literally unmuted my mic just to make like a like a boot licking noise like because <laughs> i was like at this point with this person who is just like 100 percent doing apologia for black bagging protesters and stuff and I'm like, I'm not going to let that fly. But usually yeah. it's got to be worth it. And so, like, I guess I, I do a lot of, like, on the fly internal calculus as far as, okay, is this going to, is this going to sell, like, sell well? Is this going to actually get my point across? Am I going to be making a salient point? And if I'm making something insulting, if I'm doing something that's going to be, um, like a little bit hurtful or a little bit of a dunk like is it worth it what am i going to get out of it and like it really is it really does boil down to at least in my in my mind like okay if i'm going to insult somebody is this going to be worth it and what goes into that calculation is um you know kind of complicated but um i guess like the way that i look at it is like there we can all admit there is utility to insulting people right like i think we can all admit there's a time and a place to insult somebody um yeah. some people really really hate it when they'll they'll and you know i know you i i know you you've you've gone over this before i think on your stream as well like people misusing the term ad hom um and i don't feel like i ad hom ever um i do insult people and in fact, on multiple panels, people have been like, oh, you're just ad homming. And I'm like, no, no, no. Hold on a second. I'm insulting you. There's a difference. There is a difference. <laughs> like an ad hom is like, you are dumb. Therefore, your argument is bad. An insult is just, it is my opinion that you are dumb. And that can, that actually is distinct. Um, it actually is something a little bit different because it's like, uh, I don't know. There's ownership of it. I guess that's the thing. I own yeah. my, I never try to hide my insults. If I'm going to insult somebody, then I'm sure I'm, I'm like in like, obviously not perfect, but like, I'm pretty sure I've done a pretty good amount of thinking, um, on the topic or I'm at the point in the discussion where it's worth doing that. Yeah. If that makes sense. It, it, like, so something I've just put in my notes immediately is like that if you're going to interrupt, it has to be good. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it, it just doesn't work. And um, I, I, do, I don't think I've ever actually spoken about <clears throat> Ed Hams and Stream, but like I, I'm going back to university to study philosophy. So logical fallacies mm -hmm. are they're one of the wheelhouses I like playing in. And I feel that people confuse Ad Hams with for exactly like you said if so if you were to say something along the lines of that wait no hold on you just suggested we fix like world hunger by burning crops you're a fucking idiot that's not an ad hom right <laughs> that, that is literally saying that your argument suffers because of how bad you were at making it yeah yeah absolutely yeah i think like i mean i think some people hear ad hom or they see ad hom and they've seen those little like posters going around where it's like the ad hom is like the weakest form of argument or whatever, but they don't actually yeah. understand what an ad hom is. Realistically, an ad hom that you'll see ad homs in political car like in political cartoons and in political like ads all the time where it's like, did you know that? that um did you know that that my opponent is a child molester don't vote for him you know and it's like or, or like something like that or it's like did you know that like like the cre like cre the creepy joe thing now there are arguments absolutely about the moral status of being a creepy person but it's basically like mm. oh my opponent uh is is an asshole therefore all of his policy must be bad that's an ad hom it's like i yeah. think that you're morally bad and therefore your arguments are are bad whereas again a lot of it comes down to owning it like i own my insults if i'm gonna call someone um uh, one of the most like like one of the things i literally said to somebody i was debating the other night was that is the dumbest single-handedly the dumbest argument i've ever heard on any panel in my entire life and I meant that a hundred percent and I owned it as an insult and they were just like, Oh, you, you know, yeah, yeah. Oh, there's a great one. Somebody in chat just said, you're a socialist. So you can't understand basic a economics. That is an ad hom. It's like using the character of somebody. You're a socialist. That's a like framed as a character flaw. And therefore you can't understand economics. That's like an actual ad hom, but yeah. like, I don't know, just own your insults. Like that's one of the things, like, I guess something that comes across, like, at least in my experience is like, great way for somebody to, to like 
like be seen as an asshole is to like not own up to their words is to like talk a lot of shit but then never back it up and um and that's the way that i look at it too um i tend to be pretty cutting sometimes um but i always feel like hey like this is my i i am like i am on a panel i was asked to be on this panel my audience wants to see me on this panel so um sometimes it is relevant for me to just give my raw opinion and sometimes that opinion is you're a fucking idiot you know what i mean like yeah and that doesn't necessarily have to be and and of course i i should hope that by the time i'm using an insult like that i've laid out my case enough and there's a that that is like a like a an icebreaker or it breaks the sort of like the the like um like scales that are on people's eyes is one i use a lot you know like like when somebody's set in their ways and sometimes like mm. a well-placed insult can break through that and make them go oh oh my god like did I do something really dumb or like, do I, am I really an idiot or something like that? And it's like, I don't know. That's the way, that's the way I look at them. Um, but I think there's also some other things too, which is like, I've been focusing on the, on the, like when I'm like specifically cutting, I think also though, that like part of why I feel like my debate style like sticks out a little bit is because, um, you know, I don't know. Um, most of the time I'm willing to meet people where they're at. And when you're, when you display that, um, and you're like willing to put in that effort, like people are, uh, it makes sense to people when you have something harsher to say, you know what I mean? Yeah. It also makes people listen when you have something harsh to say, if you're just always like <clears throat> always going like off the rails about like how dumb everybody is, or if you're always engaging in a really aggressive manner, it just stops being interesting after a while. I mean, certain people certainly uh, can like can sell that style, but like let's be real, like most people who are coming to watch debates um, aren't really they're not like they might like a little bit of blood sports, but they're not there for the blood sports. They're not there just to yeah. see people who go at each other and insult each other's mothers and stuff like that. Like you know, like they're they're like there to to learn something, and they might want to enjoy a little bit of drama and spice and sparks along the way. And I, I try to keep that in mind because, um, you know, it is a different space. Um, but also, like, I don't know. Like, I just find that in general, even not in debate, um, there's room with some people to be particularly, like, firm, harsh, or cutting. Um, but you have to know when is the right time. And it can be a little bit hard to determine that, for sure. Yeah. Because um, it's... Yeah. Uh, one of the th when you're even saying there along the drama and sparks, <clears throat> um, I found that Chud Logic has actually kind of like carved out a beautiful little niche for himself, mm -hmm. where he's really good at facilitating and creating. Uh, it, the word has such a horrible connotation to it now, but creating kind of a safe space for people to kind of take their gloves off mm -hmm. and just smack each other with a very uncharitable take, because the assumption is. Once it's over and you go into the post room, you all kind of say, Jesus, well done. Yeah. And and it allows for exactly like you've said, and Chud has even said this myself sometimes, because it's, it's understanding that a lot of like performative debating is entertainment because you're trying to inform an audience about what these ideas look like when they're being defended. And then how do you make that entertaining? Right. Yeah, and I mean, uh, I think that's something, like, I think, I do think that Chud is, like, like, Chud is, like, chipping away at, like, the drama enigma, at, like, how to, like, get the perfect balance, because I think there is a need for that. Like, um, debate is more interesting, and also, like, uh, this might sound almost contradictory, but, like, a, a slightly, a, like, a dramatic debate with actual substance is, is, for certain audiences going to go a lot further than a debate that from end to end is packed with perfectly like useful information. And that's just because your brain shuts off. If you're just getting a stream of information, well, if you wanted a stream of information, you could listen to an audiobook. You're at a debate because you want to hear that dialectics. You want to hear that, like, here's an idea, here's an idea, slam, what comes out? You know what I mean? And, like, so I think that, like, knowing how to and when to go in on drama is, like, um, and, and when to make it a little bit spicier, when to say, all right, no, mm. we're like going around in circles and yeah, it's fine for everybody to state their opinion, but here's why mine is better or here's why my, why my argument is stronger or whatever. Like, I think that's really important and it does bring people in and it lets people like 
cathartically work out their differences. And also, yeah. I do think just to, just to touch on the Chud thing, I do think that there's a um, like there's an interesting parallel to me. Um, I've meant I think I've mentioned this on stream before, but like, um, are you familiar with how like uh like voguing as a dance style like came about? Like, are you familiar with it at all? Um, it's the first I've heard of it. Oh, okay. So um, this was something that like really really became popular in like. I want to say I don't know the exact years like the late 80s to early 90s in like like a lot of queer communities especially in New York um this style of dance that now is like almost like it's like almost inseparable from like uh certain types of modeling is called voguing and it was like this okay. really intense like form of dance you'll see the like this kind of thing you know like the they do like weird poses and it's very like um about striking a whole bunch of poses voguing was uh there's a great film called um, paris is burning i don't know if you've ever seen it but um and in that doc in that documentary they talk about how vogue became a way for a lot of queer trans gay youth to take out their frustrations with one another without hurting one another and it was like very intense and just like you said like you get into the post room and everybody's friends and whatnot but on the stage the most intense um voguing you could imagine and in fact that's also where the term throwing shade comes from because throwing shade oh. was you would insult people and you would you would cause drama on the stage and you would be like have your 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 fans would be like cheering and be like Bleh, you know what i mean and it was called throwing shade so like when you threw shade it was like oh you're escalating so now we're gonna try even harder we're gonna show off and have even better dance moves and even better <laughs> outfits and stuff like that but it was it came from this need to like be able to like get out frustrations without actually hurting each other. And as we know, okay. people are certainly <clears throat> capable of like getting out their frustrations in very terrible ways. Um, yeah. But there are these sort of cathartic structures and I, and I, I can't help, but feel very similarly about certain forms of online leftist debate <laughs> um, and that people yeah. could benefit from seeing it through that lens. Um, and that's certainly how I, look at it a lot of the time like obviously i take um the things i'm arguing about very seriously i try to be very informed and make very um responsible arguments but with regard to how i engage with other people to me it's like hey here we are we've entered this like this arena and now we're gonna fight and then you still have to recognize there are people on the other end and um <clears throat> i think that always tempers like how far i'd be willing to go with rhetoric and also, um, you know, and also just like what type of what type of arguments I bring I bring in. Um, I do think there's like some there's I don't know, I guess I guess I just feel like Chud has done a really good job of facilitating the like essentially political voguing among online lefty weirdos, which is what we all kind of are. Right. And that space is like everybody can go in and sometimes people go really hard. But at the end of the day, it's like, ah, oh, nobody's really hurt out of this. Nobody, they might have their feelings hurt a little bit here and there. Like, I mean, I think <laughs> I can think of a few Chud Knights that have gotten real spicy. But for yeah. the most part, nobody's dead. Everybody has heard new things and their, um, you know, their ideas are bumping together and ever, and the audience is growing. They're learning things from these interactions. So I don't know. That's my, that's how I view most of my, um, most of my <clears throat> debates, um, you know, that I go into. Um, and you know, that's kind of what I have in mind, which is like, all right, we're both here to put up our best show, but at the end of the day, it's, it's still a show. The goal is, uh, the goal of the show is to get people to think harder and to perhaps come to new conclusions. But, um, but that doesn't mean we have to, you know, that doesn't mean we have to like, I mean. I guess what that means is that there's a prop, there's like a problem space, and there's specific tactics to do so. I don't know. Maybe, yeah. maybe that doesn't make much a whole lot of sense. But it's like I guess I just look no, at it no, as it a very sense, specific yeah. thing. You know, it's like um, I guess it's no, it's no different than looking at it like a game of like like soccer or you know football. Um, like like there's rules. There are certain things, and you have to know those rules in order to be able to break them to a degree. But also, like to to have your sort of to, like the best players or the best debaters are people who know how the game works and are able to subvert expectations 
and that's what I aim to do. Yeah. And it's um, it, it never even occurred to me to say this until you said that last part and brought sport into it. <clears throat> like um, I, about a decade ago now, I used to be a rugby union referee. And the age group that I kind of specialized in refereeing was kind of like under 13s and under 15s because um, they weren't very good, but you could spot the talent. And my job was to foster a respect for the game so that they could actually achieve their talent. Because we all know people who are like phenomenal at something, but they have the wrong attitude and they just they either get kicked out of it or they just lose the ability with it. But one of the things that I used to always like bring the two teams uh, together with at the beginning of the match was to say to them like that both of you are here because you love playing rugby but remember that you wouldn't be playing a game if it wasn't for the opposition turning up and agreeing to play the same game with you yep so have that sense of um son if you have rugby in ireland sorry i just have to laugh we were ranked number one in the world <laughs> going into the world cup so I just, yeah. that's it's hilarious like, that's hilarious even, to even me. i know that <laughs> Um, we're regarded as like one of the greatest rugby nations, mainly because it's like, like put it this way, like English imperialism did a lot to us. It gave us something to be proud of, and that was being better at them than their own fucking game. Um, but anyway, yeah, but it was that sent- uh, that sentimentality of explaining to these 13 or 14 year olds that the opposition exists for you to test yourself against. Mm-hmm. It is not about beating them. And if you're beating them, you're beating them at a set of rules. You're you're beating them in a technical capacity. You're not beating them as people. And it's understand that them as people are why you even get this opportunity to play in the first place. And that's that's a huge degree in what I'm hearing from you here. And even what you're describing kind of like in vogue where it's understanding that the person who's beside you is do is they're allowing you to engage in this. Uh, I'll call it kind of like cognitive of cleaning where you're allowing yourself to kind of de-stress and detoxify in what could be argued a toxic way but it's understanding that both sides they're there for each other yeah absolutely and i think there are um there are certain times where it can be hard to uh make a direct comparison because like i mean there are definitely people i've gone up against who i would consider essentially political enemies and I mean that pretty much in the most raw way imaginable. I mean, yeah. m- everyone in my audience and probably most people, a lot of people outside of my audience who are familiar with me will recall that someone once advocated for putting machine gun nests on the southern border. Um, and I bring that up a lot. And I mean, like specifically with the intention to teach immigrants a lesson. And to me, that is so disgusting and sickening. That, like, yeah. that basically makes me go, okay, then, we're playing this for blood, then. You know what I mean? Yeah. But there is still one thing, which is that at the end of the day, no matter how much, like, I beat the absolute, like, shit out of that person who is my, my, my opponent, I have to remember that even if they're my worst political opponent, I am only ever beating them for the audience. So... Like, it doesn't do anything to just ruin their life. If I can ruin their life while still um, while still keeping over the, the audience and, and making them feel like it was justified, awesome. But you never, you, you're never going to be, it's not like, you're not literally in a duel with like, a, like, a, like, a, like a, a weapons drawn duel with somebody. Like, they're going to go back to their audience and whatever. So you have to remember that. And like, I always try to remember that as well. I went pretty... I've gone pretty hard on the person, for example, who brought that one in, and I always will. I'm not Mm. going to let them live that down. Um, In fact, I usually bring it up in every conversation I've been with them since, just to remind their audience and every other person that that was the type of thing that they were advocating for. Um, And I think that's a good way to do it. Um, But I also think that, like, again, um, if, like, I think there are some people who would engage with that type of person um, and just refuse to... Uh, take them seriously or anything that they take seriously at all, which um, to be fair, I wouldn't forgive someone. I mean, I wouldn't uh, blame somebody for doing that. I would forgive somebody for like (laughs) coming to that conclusion, but I think that it makes for bad debate show. Um, You have to kind of um, be like, all right, fine. We're going to fight again. All right, let's both step up to the line and the bell rings and then we fight. And when the bell rings, we stop because at the end of the day, that's what people are there to see. Even if they're your political opponent, you have to know where the lines are. You know that like you can't just like immediately start interrupting them and and shit talking them immediately or you're just going to look like a fool. You know what I mean? And like 
So it is, it can be hard to like, uh, keep the, keep the metaphor in my, in your mind, like, because there's so many differences between a sport and a political arena. Um, but I do think it's important to like, try and remember those boundaries and, um, you know, and like know where it's like, okay, I've done, I've done my, I've given them a good walloping. I'll let them go, you know, like lick their wounds and, and hopefully, yeah. you know, some of their audience will wake up to some of the stuff. Um, again, I guess a lot of it boils down to, um, I, I try not to be, this is, this seems silly, but like when I'm making the decision, whether I'm going to engage in like dirty tactics or like pit fighting moves, like I'm going to hit you, you know, with this insult or whatever, like, um, uh, my goal is always, okay, is this actually going to bring utility? And I try to, even if there's strong emotions going on, I try to make the decision with as like as sober a uh, perspective as I can. Um, and of course, mm. you know, there's always going to be times where um, that doesn't work out. But I think as a general rule, it can be incredibly helpful, incredibly, incredibly helpful. So, yeah. Um, slightly beneath the topic, but do you ever find it difficult to stop analyzing what they're saying and instead just respond to what they're saying? Because immediately, like one of the things that popped into my head immediately was because... I like you're saying that, like, even though they are literally your political opponent, once the, the cameras are off, you'll ignore them. And it's because at the end of the day, they are just representing their ideology. It's yeah. the ideology you want to kill, not the individual. Yeah. And like immediately because because I'm fascinated, <clears throat> I'm fascinated by how ideologies sustain themselves within society mm -hmm. and especially with kind of like a Gramscian critique of hegemony. I would find it very difficult not to launch into like an analysis of explaining to the audience what's happening. And do you ever find you have to stop yourself doing that? Or is that just a me thing? Um, no, I mean, no, absolutely not. No, I, I totally understand where you're coming from. Like, um, absolutely. Like, uh, I, I think, um, like it becomes like a, a muscle memory. To, hmm. to like know when you can do that and when you can't. There are times when you can do that, but certain debates make it really hard. A great example of this was one where um, I don't, and keep in mind here, I'm not criticizing Chud at all. I don't think Chud did actually anything wrong. I just think that the circumstance ended up going against him and it happens to be a good example of this particular thing. Um, in a conversation um, on Dylan Burns' show a couple, like two weeks ago, I think, um, Chud made uh, was like somebody brought up like oh what if an IDF soldier goes into a bakery and it was talking about it had started the topic had started on gay cakes and all of that whole thing and it ended up being about oh what if an IDF soldier went into a Palestinian bakery and, and Chud was like now why the fuck would you bring up an IDF soldier that seems a little bit weird and that's like really funny and I started laughing right away but Dylan didn't take it so well was like oh are you insinuating something and the other guy was like yeah you're insinuating i'm a nazi and stuff like that and if 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 chud had had full control of that platform he could have easily gone well it's just kind of funny to me that you fixate on uh on an idf soldier in this conversation about discrimination and you're trying to like choose the most shocking thing that has some um like that has some pretty questionable vibes behind mm. it. And you could explain that. But the thing is, you're not always going to be given that opportunity. Um, and so I understand what you're saying, where it's like you can be tempted to like jump into explaining it. And there's a time, there's times where you will be given that opportunity, but most of the time in debate, you don't have the time to lay that out to the same extent. And it can be really hard because you're going to deal, if you debate right wingers, you're going to deal with a lot of dog whistles and it can be really, really hard um, to not, um, uh, yeah, in this case, yes, ace man. Yeah. Um, the, uh, it can be really, really hard to not like want to go, Hey guys, just so you know, this is a dog whistle. Now you might be able to, if it's a, if it's as, if it's as ridiculous of one, like for example, somebody said 1350 in one of my conversations and I was like, hold up a second. I'm sorry. I don't mean to interrupt, but just so you all know, that's an incredibly well-known um, racial dog whistle. Let me just explain what that means. They're referring to these false, these stats that are falsely presented in order to make a certain narrative. I will not be going on to that topic. I think that is a very, very dishonest attempt to pivot from that, from the actual topic at hand. 
there's one where you can actually analyze their where their ideological like predilections are um are like leading them but it's really hard to do that sometimes it's really yeah. easy to like um i mean god the number of times i've had dog whistles um just chucked up and it's just like you sometimes just have to let them go and address the argument at hand um yeah um so uh yeah it, it, you do have to resist it a little bit but it's not you don't want to like kill that instinct because that instinct is super valuable you just have to know um like you just have to know what your um like when you're going to to use it and when you're ready when you're going to take that tool out you have to recognize it's a very specialized tool um yeah. i think it's i think it's something that actually is um really a useful thing to understand from people who are used to doing prepare like prepared or solo content because you can always do it in solo content in solo content you can reach in and grab that scalpel and you could just go to town if you want to just cut open any dog whistle you want you could pull up all kinds of resources you could pull up articles on hand you can't do that during a debate even a one-on-one -on -one debate um you have to be yeah. very very um selective about stuff i mean hell even the way that studies are used in like um panel debates are is really um you know is is really weird um and like you have to have a study that's easily digestible if you're going to bring up a study um or something like that make sure it's one that's digestible make sure it's one that can be quickly made to be understood by the people in the audience um this was something i feel that like uh at one point during um like the vosh destiny eric striker um that whole debacle there was a part yeah. where they um where they started to kind of get off on like oh yes i've dropped a study in the chat i've dropped a study in the chat and it's like nobody can see the chat none of the people in the audience can see the chat um and we've done that i've done that on on other debate nights as well however if you uh there are times where it's really great i think that in the last uh night that like in that last panel show that i was on there was a point in which um i it was lucid fox came into my chat dropped a study that i was then able to give to both their chat the, the like public chat and the private chat and it was a really concise article with the study attached that talked about how um in 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 fiji like there was uh after the introduction of western media there was an 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 absolutely unbelievable spike in um eating disorders um among Ooh. the fijian population specifically women in in fiji because there was so much of a focus on the thinness and the airbrushing of models in western media that it was it was completely cult like totally smashed the way that they viewed uh weight in their country and that's like in so just so incredibly helpful and um but that's like a minority of the time so it's kind of like that where like oh like there's times where i'm like oh i have a study for this um and you have to be careful when you're going to bring those up because a lot of the times it'll just sound like you're just kind of bloviating and and trying to get people to go read a big thing that you know that they will never be able to understand anyway because it's specialized jstor blah 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 um, but there is a time and a place, but you have to kind of learn to like temper it and use it as a surgical mm. tool that you occasionally bring out at the right moment. Um, because I mean, you know, with the topic of not being an asshole, what is, what is more asshole -ish than dropping a tome, uh, into, into yeah. like, imagine if you're at a, a dinner party having a discussion and all of a sudden you just run to your, you run to your room and come running back out with, with a book the size of a dictionary and plop it on the table and go, yes, if you read this, you will come to understand my positions perfectly. Um, yeah. But here's a nice allegory for, to explain exactly how this feels. If you're ever, <coughs> if you're ever, ever having an argument with a Christian, they just kind of go, well, and then they read off a Sam verse where it's kind of like they drop the Bible down. You're kind of like, I don't care. Why are you doing this to me? I don't care. It doesn't actually make your point. Um, I'd imagine that's what you're trying to avoid. Yep. Um, and it's like, like my background is in physics. I came out of a physics um, program because the math was killing me. And that's one thing that I notice all the damn time in like the popular misunderstandings of science is people will like share something and they fundamentally misunderstood the fucking point. 
Um, we saw one recently where people were talking about, um, recently, it could have been six months ago, where like uh, physicists have discovered parallel universes when what it was was that a potential avenue of further research if some researches lead in a particular direction and maybe we can consider investing in a hypothetical theory and if those theories are proven then maybe we consider the potential for uh, parallel universes and somebody just went ah we found parallel universes right yeah i mean that's that old the old adage of like it it it's uh it's it's very it's incredibly easy to spread misinformation and it's incredibly hard to put down misinformation um yeah oh i just realized I don't I I need to put real quick before we go any further I want to um I want to put up I realized my text was uh here I want to make sure that your name's up on here cuz I realized when I moved my camera it covered up your little nameplate on there and I want to make sure that people know who I'm talking to so Oh lovely it's ah uh, no it won't ah Here we go bam I I'll do the same cuz for whatever reason it just won't keep the names up there we go. That looks much better. And I also, if you could give me just one quick second, I need to real quick. Uh, I promised I would uh, enable something on yeah, my channel. Time. Sorry, I don't mean to distract from this, but I, I somebody redeemed. They wanted me to put on emotes uh, bouncing across the screen, and they paid a whole bunch of points for it. So I feel I should do my <laughs> my fair share. Let me see. What's the thing it's called? The emote wall i think yes this is the one there we go let me just add this real quick sorry for the delay everybody i just want to make sure that i'm doing this correctly that way that i can properly There we go. All right, so now we should have the emote wall. There we go. All right, everybody, drop your emotes if you want to see them bounce everywhere. Okay, all done. Mm -hmm. Now I've fulfilled my promises. I've done my part as the streamer person. I'm not a. Uh, I'm not making myself a filthy liar, and <laughs> we can continue. Anyway, so sorry about that. Oh, no, you're fine. Um, on, on exactly on the topic of how not to be an asshole, would you ever find it very difficult for like that if you're debating with somebody who's very right wing and they post a study and you know the study doesn't say what they're saying it is, how do, how do you play that without making it look like you're just dismissing the study? Um, yeah, uh, that can be really hard. Sometimes people get you with a study. And, and sometimes that's one where you can turn their scalpel into a useless tool. Because what you can do is when they drop the study, then you can go, wait a second, I know this study. This study was like thoroughly debunked. This study was from the 1970s. And you're you're quoting me this? And, and then all of a sudden it turns it on ahead. Because if you're going to drop a study, that is, like it or not, <laughs> the fucking oh no um like it or not um that that sort of thing is uh it's an invocation of authority and people take a certain the way i see it at least people take trust if you're going to bring a study into it people are going to go oh okay i may not know everything about this study but um they're they're quoting something that's clearly researched so they probably actually have a point you know what I mean? Maybe it's not to the same degree, but they'll give that gives you like a point of of like margin in your, like a like the margin of error starts to tilt towards your, you, and like mm. um, if they do that and you're like, wait a minute, this study is bullshit. Here's a whole bunch of reasons why it's bullshit, and you happen to know that one. Like for example, one that I know that I can do that off any given moment. Um, I can um, I can grab a I can grab that study and tear the shit out of it. Is the John Hopkins um, like trans depression study? Um, that one is like one where I know for a fact that if people bring that up, I can go. This study is from 1979. It all that it did was it very simply analyzed um, before and after happiness after having. SRS only. They did not take HRT into um, into account. HRT at the time um, had 
like a, t a totally different we had a totally different understanding of hrt that is completely transformed since 1979 and this study has been since um heavily heavily um researched um with with a with much better considerations including like societal things it, one of the most major counter studies that was like done in response to the um john hopkins study see i'm literally doing it right now L like that there you go all of a sudden that that point of like trust that their audience that the audience had and hey this person's bringing up a study okay they might actually have something to it gone so and then if they bring other studies up if if you it, it's like a double-edged sword if you bring up a study you got to make sure that it's easy to understand and bulletproof because if you don't mm. you've you've tested you've like uh you, you, you now have lost credibility. By bringing up a debunked study, you've lost, no one will trust any other study that you bring yeah. up. So that's why the, the, the if, if somebody else is bringing up a study and if it's a right winger, they're probably gonna bring up some sort of debunked study. Let's just be real, you know, no, no hate, but it's true. 90% of the time, it's gonna be some like, it's gonna be something from like the bell curve or, um, or whatever. Or it's going to be some debunked trans study from 1962 that that's been researched 170 thousand times since then, and nobody has come to the same conclusions. It, so just you have to just be willing to go okay. And if they drop a study that's um that's completely out of the blue, um and you do, you don't know anything about it, you can always go oh yeah, I'd be really interested in to um you know I'd be really interested in taking a look at this, but I can't really engage with this type of study um right off the um right off the bat without any um you know without any input or without any ability to read it myself so again that's the whole thing there's with with studies it, it goes both ways and you have to just be confident enough to remember that like if somebody drops a study in the middle of your chat um it's not reasonable for anyone to be able to engage with a study offhand like that unless you're having that type of a debate um like a very academic debate um and um yeah so just remember that and and keep in mind that if somebody drops a giant debate in the middle of your discussion you are not out of line to say sorry i can't engage with something i haven't read um <clears throat> that's really super interesting i'd love to see what it has to say but i wouldn't really be able to engage i won't really be able to engage you on that um without being able to read it myself and see what sort of methodology went into it or whatever also keep in mind that like at the end of the day, most people are not statistics experts and very few of them can actually speak to the viability of, of a study. Um, most people who are going to be debating are just as much, um, are just as much, uh, relying on a sort of social contract of trust around studies as the audience is. And so if you're just yeah. like, well, you know, I can't really analyze this particular study. If they've just dropped a study out of nowhere when you're having a, a, um, you know, a sort of not like like regular debate that's just pulling from from news sources or something like that um and somebody drops a study you just have to know whether it's appropriate to engage in it try to debunk it or or just say sorry like this is way out of the scope of what we came in here talking about yeah. usually when they do that uh again most of my experiences with people dropping studies um has been either it's a study that's just open and shut this is incredibly clear um a hu massive massive meta study or something like that that's just overwhelming evidence and then you can just drop it and anybody in the chat can look at it and go oh holy shit um or it's really misleading and it's like one like a well-known debunked study like that's the ones that people tend to pull on um i tend to again i tend to avoid using studies in most debates but there are times where it comes up and you know, you just got to know whether it's appropriate or not. Again, just yeah. just try to remember if for anybody, uh, if you want an analogy, just whether think about whether you would actually run into your office, grab a giant book, and flop it on the table if you were having an argument with your friends. Yeah. yeah so, because there's there's two things to take out of this. This is just <clears throat> these are stuff that I picked up over time. The first one is if anybody drops like a study in the chat, the first thing you should do is don't go to the tables and look at the data, read the conclusion. Mm -hmm. This is one of the things I learned in physics. All data is used in facilitation of an argument to reach conclusions. The data on its own means absolutely nothing because the data was collected in service of a context. So mm -hmm. read the context, read the conclusion. Well, um, I... this, sorry, go on. Oh, no, no. Um, go ahead. Sorry. You can finish that thought. I was right. just 
going to comment on scientific studies in general and, um, you know, people, <sighs> there's, there's this thing that happens. I am literally like, okay, uh, technically everyone is qualified to read and understand a scientific study. Um, but we all have like limitations, right? Like I don't have a degree in biology. I studied biology for like a year and a half and I've been to college like three times and shit, but I don't have a fucking degree. I'm not like a licensed expert. Not that that's the only thing that matters. It's just that realistically, it's very easy to lie with statistics. So oh, incredibly yeah. Easy. So that's the reason why I say that like in the, for, in the, in the context of debate, a study is it might as well be a news article. You have to treat it exactly the same. Okay, is is this article like from like the Daily Caller and are they like conveniently preaching to an exact right-wing talking point? You might be willing to point out that there's some pretty big bias there. The same goes for studies. If you see a study that's like you know, has a, a clearly biased um like a clearly biased approach um, and like its conclusions are just not even close to what, like, like if their conclusions are really wild, um, and, and, and highly extrapolative off the data, then you might be able to go, okay, like this is not something I'm comfortable engaging with. I would need to do a lot more hmm. research, but in general, um, let's be real in most debates, no one is actually going to read the studies. They're just looking for whether they can find a conclusion that will support their point. And that's okay yeah. because, um, the the part of uh of like reading the studies and coming to conclusions about them is a more complicated process that's almost always going to happen off screen and that's okay so yeah i just wanted yeah, to say I, that about studies that was actually the second thing i was going to say and this is advice for anybody who would have the same disposition as me i'm i'm naturally inquisitive and curious so if i come across a study and a conclusion that i haven't come across before I have to fight the instinct to say, oh, walk me through that. In a debate, that's a big no-no. Uh, do that off screen. Yeah, basically, yeah. I mean, unless unless the entire, like, basis of their argument is, like, based around that study, and then you might be able to get them to, like, to be like, oh, really? Yeah. So can you tell me a little more about the study? Like, I would love to do that to somebody who brings up that trans study. And I think that would be, like, it's, like, the equivalent of, like... Yeah. Like I can't, I'm trying to come up with a metaphor of it. It's like, it's like, um, if like you were in like the, the Roman Colosseum in, in the height of summer and your opponent walks in, in like head to toe in like obsidian armor and they're just like, kh, kh, and the sun is beaming down on them. Like just being like, yeah, come on, tell me like that might totally defeat them because they're just going to exhaust themselves and their own audience in the process of trying to explain to you, you know, but like most of the time, that is a very special case. Of course, the rules of every debate is you got to read the room. Like that's the first thing you have to try and get a feel for what type of people, what type of environment you're talking in, who you're talking with, um, stuff like that. But yeah, most of the time, give, getting people to talk about their studies is just going to be giving them a platform to say whatever bullshit they want, unfortunately. Yeah. Even though I think the inquisitive approach is a very good thing as an audience member, not so much when you're on the debate yeah. stage. Yeah. For the most part, you want to be uh, decided. Yeah, because the, the main reason why I wear and warn against it is because um, if – if they pick up on the fact that you don't know where they're going, they will probably take that license to just invent conclusions out of it. Uh, it it's why I say if somebody drops a study, the first thing you should do is look at the conclusion to find out, one, did they even read the study correctly? Because if they disagree with the conclusion, chances are they didn't actually understand the study. Um, yep. But the second one is just, it's like, don't give people free reign to invent. Kind of like, because it's, if you ask somebody to explain a study for you, They'll probably misread it because it's it, 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 like to get biased for a second. It's very rare I come across a right winger who cites a study and what they think is actually what the study said. So I don't trust them to explain it to me. That's why I won't ask them. I mean, this happens a lot with the news, too. In fact, the segment that I'm going to be doing with my stream after this is explicitly talking about just that, where it's um, like the sources that are cited contradict what the right winger is saying like in their video. So like they're talking propaganda and they have citations that are just there um, to uh, 
they're just there um simply to um to make them seem like they're creden like they're credentialed yeah. and like they did the work but then if you actually look at any of the sources they're contradicted it's like a great example was like last night I, I was uh watching this video to debunk on stream today and I went to one of their sources and it literally says in that source that like the literal opposite of what they claimed in the video. And I'm just like, this is so, it's so shameful. Like, so that is unfortunately yeah. just, a, a, maybe it sounds partisan, but it's constant. This is something you will engage with constantly when you're debating right-wingers. Much less of a problem when you're debating other left-wingers, which is actually why when it comes to studies and news articles and citations, when I'm going up against a left-winger, I'm much more scared about having my my ducks in a row with that sort of shit than I am with, when going against a right-winger. Because 99% of the time, if a right-winger brings up something, it's going to be like, I have this study done by the Heritage Foundation. It's like, oh, okay, awesome. I'm glad that you have a one of the oldest most most right wing and historically racist um uh think tanks that doesn't pretend to even be a scientific organization um like that's your quotation for a study is like uh they they talked to their think tank council and the council said our opinion is that uh i don't know race is race is a genetically deciding factor of intelligence or some stupid shit like that like you know what i mean it's just yeah. dumb so yeah for sure. Um, one one thing that just popped into my head, and I might just send an open call out to leftists to do this if they're not already doing it. Mm -hmm. Um, just pop onto like Paul Fortune and all the different places where you get kind of like the right wing uh, sources being disseminated, and just generate a little text doc document. That way, if you're debating someone and they drop a source, just very quickly control paste it and search for that link in there and find out where did they get this from? Because if it's in there, it's very possible they don't actually understand the source. They're just regurgitating something they've heard. And if they're regurgitating it, uh, you've you've then got kind of like a whispered affect to it where they don't even realize that they're explaining to you. Uh, I've lost track of my own point. Uh, they don't get that they're not actually rooting their ideas in reality. They're just, they're, they're, they're editorializing an editorial. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think, uh, I think, uh, Vosh, to give credit where credit is due, is really good at that. He'll be like, oh yeah, I see this one on poll all the time. Like, yeah. that is like a really good way to do it. You almost never, at least in my in my opinion, you almost never want to like um, be like, oh, where'd you find that? Poll? Because that comes across as really like snooty. But if you're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you play it really, really casual, like, oh yeah, I see that one on poll all the time. It's like, oh yeah, you know what you're in the know and that like plays to all audiences whereas like dunking on someone for finding a study on poll will play really well to lefty audiences it won't really play that well to others yeah. um at least in my my experience I, I, uh that ties to something as well actually is that um if you're in the middle of like a panel with like six or seven people will you find yourself paying more attention to the panelists and their arguments or the audience's reaction to those panelists um or how do you split your attention between that um well, to be honest, I I never ever keep pa like panel chat open, <laughs> um, almost ever, um, because I don't I, I I don't really care for that. I keep my own chat open for sure, and sometimes people from my chat will really cool be like, hey, um, panel chat was like is like cheering for you, and sometimes when I watch a vod, I'll see like ah yeah I did good, um, like but um, usually I keep that sort of analysis for after. Um, the show and go back and watch a VOD and see how the audience was reacting to things that I was saying. Um, and then I will gauge that for future engagement. It's really hard to, to like read the audience yeah. during a, um, during a, during the debate. You can sometimes. Um, but for the most part, I, I try to, I try to focus on, um, on a panel. I will try to focus on like, mo on like areas where I, can I hear an argument going out and I okay, will identify, okay, here's somewhere that I can hit. Here's somewhere else that I can hit with something strong. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of times it really is a, uh, it's like, a, I don't know. It's, it's a game where you have to kind of like be guarded and then strike when you have, when you see the opportunity uh, on a panel, because um, there's so many other people and it is hard. Like, I think panels are uniquely um, challenging in some ways um, because it's like there's so many other people. Um, also, yeah. on that, specifically addressing panels, um, one of the things that you have to learn how to do is is 
is interrupt well. And um, that sounds terrible, but it's just an out. It is an absolute fact of Twitch panels specifically. If you don't talk, if you don't speak up, you will never, they will just, people will talk over you. That's just yeah. how it goes. So that doesn't mean that you need to constantly be interjecting yourself over other people. In fact, I would argue if you do that, you will be guaranteed to become across as an asshole. Um, however, you need to know when to say, actually, hold on a second. I'd really like to get onto that or, or go, all right, all right, all right, all right. Let me just address that real quick because, um, you have to be able to um, – it's something that I think like people going into panel stuff, interested in going into panel stuff, need to realize is that you're going to eventually have to interrupt somebody, um, and that's okay. Um, it's okay to interrupt as long as you're not a, like like really overpowering with it, um, and even sometimes you can. Like there have been times where I've literally been like, no, I'm not fucking letting this go. Like bullshit. Like you were just straight up lying right now and just straight up interrupted somebody, and that's okay. People will get mad about it. But it's actually okay to do that sometimes. You, you, in fact, yeah. you have to do it sometimes. Just don't, just don't lean on that too much. Learn how to interrupt well and with purpose. Um, and yeah, sometimes it is a little hard to gauge that. I mean, I've made mistakes before. Even you know, obviously, I'm not like some sort of god of debate. But I just think like I think I I do de tend to have a pretty decent grasp of like when to um, of like when to interrupt somebody or when to like say hey all right all right yeah. you've had your time it's my turn um yeah but it is it is something i like i mean i've been on panels with people who just won't talk they just will not talk they want to wait their turn but nobody's going to call on you it's not going to happen like that that's not how these things go so yeah i i, I was noticing that that probably would have been the road i'd go down which is why i'm i'm doing my due diligence to just ask around mm -hmm. <clears throat> because um about a month ago i had a conversation with book smarts just in general terms of how to argue like coherently um of just like the, if, if you're going to get into a, like a back and forth with somebody and you disagree how, how do you actually go somewhere with that conversation and one of the I, I raised the idea of like how do you not be an asshole to them and one of the things that um he said to me was uh, and it's why I mentioned the chat, uh, but I, I think now it's probably like it's an intermediary to an expert skill where you have to like be really good at what you're doing to almost be able to like uh, absorb what the panel is saying without really paying attention so that you can look at chat. And it's almost like if chat is annoyed at somebody, you pretty much have free reign to interrupt them and be obnoxious and you will not come across as rude because you become the voice of the people in that regard. And ask yourself, why do people like Trump get away with what they do? It's because people see themselves in his interruptions. And mm -hmm. we always like to look, we always, because it's like, here's one of the interesting psychological things about chat. If you're in chat during a debate, you feel absolutely powerless because you're watching this thing unfold in front of you and you know they're lying. So if somebody goes, ah, ho, don't fucking lie to chat like that, you ass, what are you? They will love you for that. You're you could be yep. the ho most horrible person ever, but they will fucking cheer you. And um, that was one thing that he was pointing out to me, and it, it ties exactly to what you were saying earlier, uh, where that you're not really arguing with them; you're arguing with the ideas they're representing. Yeah. Um, and it, and it's channeling that idea. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're spot on with that. Like, um, I mean, this is this is not just like I mean. Again, I don't want to like call on 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 popular streamers who've said this stuff because this is this is bigger than just them. Like this is an old tactic, like an old debate tactic to like practice debate is like always when you're trying to debate, like you almost have to like tactically distance yourself from yourself. You have to like ta tactically disassociate from yourself and pretend that you're somebody in the audience watching yourself. And what would you want your what would you want you to say if if you were watching this debate from the audience and that touches directly on that like the ability to channel what the the like people getting mad in the audience were like hey this is unjust um hmm. like you can channel that and use that to sort of take charge of a debate um for sure like absolutely um another thing too is just like um debates are like are about strength like that's just a fact they're they are a um and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Like, I think that people tend, I think there's a, there's a tendency on among leftists to be very skeptical of strength. Obviously makes sense. Absolutely. Um, but you have to remember that there's like, like strength is, is, is ultimately a trait. It is not necessarily like in, in a, in a really, 
problematic and, and um, troubled hierarchical world, strength becomes the only thing that matters. Um, and that's not what we're building for, but that doesn't mean that strength doesn't matter at all. Um, and in a debate, it is a test of strength. It is a form of like sport. Um, and that means that um, people will conclude that if you're unwilling to risk breaking certain rules, that you're too cowardly to be on the stage um, and or too weak to be on the stage. And you, so that's why I say that like with interruptions, you have to learn when you're, when you are in the right to interrupt we, um, because people, there's all kinds of rules in life that we know are like, uh, they're not really as hard rules as everything else. Like for example, no yeah. one's going to throw you off a panel for interrupting. <clears throat> Interruptions happen all the time. <clears throat> Same way as you're not going to go to prison for life for speeding. Uh, hopefully, uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you will. Um, maybe you will. Um, but <laughs> maybe these days, I don't know. But, uh, but yeah, it's like, it's like nobody is going to, to view you as a bad person for like getting a speeding ticket. There's going to be a guy you probably shouldn't have gotten caught. Right. Same thing goes for interruption. You just want to make sure you're not getting caught. That's just the rule. You have to know when it's time and when, when, uh, even the moderator might be on your side in interrupting somebody. So yeah, but yeah. It, it is a bit of a, it's a bit of an art, but it, it's an important one. I think, um, um, yeah, I think it's an important one. Mm. Um, yeah. Because it's... Um, uh, one thing I want to ask, how are you for time? Are you on a clock or... Oh, no. I'm good for as long as you want to go. <laughs> I was thinking we would talk for like two or three hours or something like that. I don't know. I always just I, assume I, three hours for everything I sign up for because it's like my the panels I'm on always go for... Th but we don't have to go that long. Whatever is good for you. Yeah. Um, like two to three works me uh, it, it's it's so that I can kind of look because it's uh, an hour and a half in is always the perfect time to ask because that way yeah. you know if you're running short or if you can then kind of go okay I have a question that requires like an hour of setup yeah those I'm, kind of things sometimes if you want to go for another like 40 minutes or something I'm okay with that I'm sure there's tons of stuff we can find to talk about and then maybe we can go from there if you still have stuff we want to talk about we can check in and like in that time or something i'm cool with whatever honestly by the way i i've i've loads more things to prick your brain on oh yeah go for it Sh shoot because it's <clears throat> like you were saying earlier one of the things that um you said that you found interesting is the dilemma between debating the right and debating the left because um, totally it's, different. it's a different beast altogether between the two but i often wonder do you find it difficult when um, this is a lot to this is a lot to chew and bite off because it's okay. it's like two or three things that overlap we constantly hear on Twitter the idea that you should never engage with the right and that you should never debate the right. But we also hear the idea that you need to not have leftist infighting. Do you ever find that that is an impossibly difficult thing to navigate between like no leftist infighting implies they want you to debate the right, but debating the right is a faux pas because you're not supposed to give them a platform. But then if you don't do that, well, then you're not doing anything. So you have to debate the left. But if you're debating the left, it's infighting. It's, do you ever find that a difficult thing to navigate? I'll be honest with you, no, um, but that's because I'm callous to that and I don't give a shit. Um, I think that's unique. I think a lot of people do struggle with that and I understand that. And here's why I can explain my my approach on it um, hmm. and, um, and why. Okay, so when it comes to like leftist infighting, all you need to do is go read any letter between any historical leftist and any other historical leftist, if they coexisted at the same time. And, um, and you will realize that leftist infighting is one of the oldest things that's ever existed. And it's one of our biggest strengths. Now you could absolutely, it's also one of our biggest weaknesses, which I can address in a second. Um, leftists infight because we have a huge diversity of opinions. There are all kinds of different versions um, of, of specific types of leftism. That is not the case on the right. Um, the right is like a bunch of highly indoctrinated, like especially the further right you go. The further right you go, the more it boils mm. down to uh, evangelical, like uh, extreme, like extremely conservative, various religions. There's those like, th like sort of roots, but they're all about indoctrination and tradition. Every single one of those, um, of those, uh, of like the right wing major right wing power centers are, uh, participate in their own form of very strict indoctrination. And that's just not the case on the left. On the left, it's like the more left you get, the more it branches out until people are like, oh, I'm an anarcho syndicalist with, 
blah blah <laughs> tendencies. I mean, that's literally a meme. Like people say this meme all yeah. the time. Like, um, and that's because um, a because as you understand more things, you're more likely to come to slightly different conclusions. And, and that's encouraged. Um, liberatory ideologies encourage you to think about more things, to have a unique opinion that's yours. Um, and like, so I think that there are degrees, of course, um, like, but most of the, the like idea that you're not supposed to disagree with any lefties or that like leftist infighting is a bad thing um it's usually it's kind of like cancel culture where people say all kinds of different things um that uh oh god damn somebody somebody in my chat says i'm a sock dem with neoliberal tendencies i'm like no god no not that one <laughs> but uh it is kind of like like there's this i don't know it's kind of like cancel culture where people say yeah. they say that word and mean like four or five different things because some people say like, Oh, leftist infighting. Um, like, I mean, my pinned tweet for like six months has been, you know, um, you know, be, d d critique, disagree. Absolutely. But don't fucking, um, sensationalize or lie about like other people on the left. Like this sort of shit has been exploited by the right wing for all of history and they're doing it mm. now too. Um, and believe it or not, <clears throat> d despite some people coming to that conclusion and saying, oh, this is just leftist unity. No, I'm saying literally I encourage people to disagree with each other and critique each other very severely. I think especially the more power you attain, the more power you attain, the more critique you should be having. Um, but we have to realize like how far is too far because it is possible for um, like, I mean, hell, how many leftist movements were completely destroyed by the fact that like the CIA literally um, instilled infighting and ca caused them to get to the point where they literally killed each other. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, I think it was, I was literally reading like two days ago about Huey P. Newton and how he was killed by another group of Marxist Leninists who, uh, happened to have a disagreement that was ex that was then exploited by the FBI and the CIA to lead to a, a war, and then he got killed by another group of Marxist Leninists. It's like, oh shit! Like that's pretty terrible. Um, you probably shouldn't get to that point. Um, and so uh, I think that gets into the like sensationalization and lying. Once you stop, once you like let go of that, it does like leftist infighting does become a problem. But the meme that when people say when they're like leftist infighting, like Twitter spats and stuff means nothing. It's yeah. they're meaningless. They're completely and utterly meaningless. The only time I really like hate it is when people start to become like visibly um, and severely. Um, like affected by this like if you're um i think an example of this is like sort of hate mobs that went after um after contra points at certain points um and and um i've seen i've seen a couple of examples of this um where i would categorize it as genuinely crossing the line into actual leftist infighting where it's like oh this is like a sensationalization that's worked itself up into a furor that's causing actual material harm to people but for the most part people disagreeing with each other and calling each other names and clashing and whatnot is is nothing and then also on the other side when it comes to like oh don't engage with righties um like uh yeah i have certain problems with like um again living up to the first part of being perfectly willing to critique people i had a lot of critiques of say peter coffin for um going up for con considering going on a plat on lauren chen's yeah lauren chen's um platform to debate milo yiannopoulos because to me that's a very stupid decision um especially um for someone like like uh, you know i don't think highly of peter coffin's debate abilities but that's my personal opinion um but again so i i think that's perfectly fine to critique that sort of thing but we have to argue against the right it's it's yeah. like just arguing against the right isn't necessarily platforming them um it can be if you're not careful um i think that like something that people uh need to realize is that there are certain types of righties who should never be platformed unless you are absolutely sure that you can completely destroy them. I tend to think yeah. that way about Nazis, for example, like hardcore Nazis, um, not just cryptos. Um, they're, it, Nazis um, engage in such a level of conspiratorial thinking um, that most of the time you need to be able to go in and humiliate them, make them look like an absolute clown. And if you can't do that, you're probably going to lose 
the uh, you're going to lose the debate um and uh, i know i'm kind of getting into the weeds with this but i think it's important which is like the reason why i've concluded is this because i have an understanding of how right-wing ideology works and how like extreme right-wing recruitment works they're looking to scoop vulnerable people out of any audience that they can find they will take any platform that they can that that as long as they think they're not going to be made a clown they will take that platform yeah. It's very, very similar to how certain like young earth creationists like um, Kent Hoven and Ken Ham, um, like um, they would take nearly any platform and they would get in stupid debates where they make arguments that make no sense. And to somebody who's in the know, they look foolish. It's, it's ridiculous, but they're not, they don't care about people who are in the know. They care about scooping vulnerable people out of the audience to grow their cultish following. And you have to be mm. careful about that. They cannot do that if they be, look like a clown. If you make them look like a clown to even their own audience, you've you've done you've completely destroyed the spell. But you have to realize that you're engaging in something that is not <laughs> traditional like logic. Because when you go talk to a young earth creationist, there is no discussion of facts going on there. They will not yeah. be discussing facts with you. It's a show of strength. They're trying to show that their faith is stronger than your facts, than your ability to communicate facts. And you have to go in and realize this is not a facts discussion. This is about me proving that you're a huckster, that you're a liar and a fraud. And that's the same approach that I take with extreme right-wingers, um, like yeah. ext the most extreme. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of right-wingers do dip into um, that sort of extremist language when you push them enough. But in most contexts, if they're not like presenting themselves from the get go as an extreme right winger, they're probably going to make themselves look look clownish if they lean too far into the right wing in a like a neutral space. So, for example, Hippy Dippy podcast is a great example of this. Um, I think Hippy Dippy is a really, really good show. Um, there are some right wingers who go on there who I think have really, really um, questionable views who probably shouldn't be platformed anywhere except for Hippy Dippy. Um, and, uh, and, but hippy dippy provides a space where most of the audience is going to be, you know, relatively interested centrists. Um, and yeah. the, the people who come on there are not going to be understood. They're, they're understood to not be Nazis. Um, and so there's sort of a social understanding that if somebody starts dipping into Nazi shit, they've made a clown of themselves on the air. See how this gets a little bit complicated? <laughs> so, uh, oh, yeah. again... It's 5D chess, yeah. Yeah, it is, it is a certain degree of 5D chess. But th that's why I kind of disregard what most of the, like, public opinion on whether you should talk to right-wingers or whether you should fight with lefties. Um, I don't... I think that everybody should talk about stuff. In general, we should debate. The, the times when you need yeah. to be careful is about platforming complete hucksters, complete demagogues, um, and... And also, um, when it comes to lefties, where you want to be careful where you're veering into like serious material harm or disinformation. If you're if you're going to make like really spurious like extreme claims, great example of this, um, that Gwen Snyder person claiming that like Chapo's audience is primed for a Nazbol takeover. Like, okay, you might have some bad thoughts about, about Chapel. You might really hate them. You might think they even promote some class reductionist language. Those are all reasonable. But once you start accusing something completely unprovable and out and, and yeah. not only unprovable, but really extreme, that's a bad thing to do. You've now started, you've, you've started essentially, um, you've started a rift that convinces your audience that they are the enemy. And now you've gone to the line and, on the converse side of it for the right, like say you just have a random Nazi come onto your stream, uh, like, or you go onto a random Nazi stream and grant legitimacy to their unbelievable conspiracy theory. <laughs> even if you come up with facts, they don't care about that. So you yeah. have to, um, you have to be, uh, you have to be careful about that. Um, yeah. yeah. And not to, not to critique or tell Gwen how she is to go about her critiques and things like that. But one of the things that, upsets me about kind of like the way that they went about that constructive critique was because if they just add at the very beginning i'm concerned that chapels because right there you can set up a premise where it's like the term is you're inductively reasoning because you're not saying they are prime for nasbols you're saying i'm concerned that if things fall a certain way and they can be pushed towards that because you're expressing a concern for what they're capable of 
and then you lay out your treatises, uh, treatises about like X, Y, and Z can happen, and if we don't prevent this, we're losing people, and then it's so much more reasonable. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> like that's, and that's why I say like it's really like it's really. Uh, I guess my opinion on um, the the leftist infighting and platforming right wingers thing is uh, just watch out for the extremes. That's basically how it goes. Other than that, I don't give a shit. Like uh, some people have a problem with hippy dippy and engaging on hippy dippy because there's right wingers, but I'm also like um, we're going to, like on the higher levels of politics, we're going to be engaging with right wingers way worse than the people who show up on hippy dippy. And hippy dippy is basically like a, a an arena where like 200 viewers will come in and watch us usually pretty successfully practice these arguments. And that's a pretty good thing yeah. if you ask me. Um, so I, I just don't, I just kind of ign uh, ignore most people who whine about like minor examples of platforming. Um, like, I mean, also I know a lot of people critique some of the bigger debate streamers for platforming, but I'm like, I don't know. I think there are a few cases where it probably went the wrong way. Um, but for the most part, I don't think that's the case. Um, when we're talking about like like the extremes of platforming, it's more stuff like New York Times giving like David Brooks uh, a uh, a a fucking um, a op ed or stuff like that's actual or, or like or like writing like this glowing like humanization article about like a rural Nazi family or something like that. Like these are the sorts of things that are like I I consider to be the extremes of problematic platforming. And I think yeah. that some of that discussion has sort of dropped down into Twitch space without people actually thinking about like, wait a minute, we're talking about like relatively small streams, um, smashing ideas back and forth. And it's a little, it's, it's quite different than the New York times, which has like a, still has like millions of in the re in the readership numbers, you know? So, yeah. Cause the, um, <clears throat> The uh, the the New York Times uh, discussion about the Nazi family mm -hmm. that that upset me at a core visceral level because the the problem isn't necessarily that they interviewed them is that they interviewed them seventy years too late. Yeah, um, I fundamentally at a core fundamental level, <clears throat> um, I consider the reason we've created a society that Nazis are able to come back into is because we have so expertly dehumanized them where no human can be a Nazi anymore. Yeah. So we, we literally don't recognize Nazis anymore. We have so successfully villainized and cartoonified it where like, uh, unless you're literally goose stepping down the street, you're not a Nazi. <clears throat> well, you know, it's funny so, you bring that up. Um, I watched the movie. Um, we're getting, I hope you're all right with me, like veering a little bit into some media stuff, but uh, oh, work away, yeah, yeah. I watched uh, yeah. last night. I watched the movie "The Boy with the Striped Pajamas." Um, again, I've seen it before, and um, my partner was like, "I don't know, I don't know if I can get into it." The car the portrayal of the Nazis was so cartoonish, like it, it it clashed with the tone. I'm like, but they kind of are always pretty cartoonish, like. Isn't that something we've encountered um, throughout history? Um, is is this like this fact that like um, they are cartoonish? Like even right now, like Donald Trump and the like way that they downplay an obvious disease that's rampaging through the country is so cartoonish. You couldn't even mm. like you can't even believe that like they were literally calling it a hoax. They try to call it the China virus and the Chinese virus. Like it's so cartoonish. And so it's like it is hard. And um and I think that like I think you're right to a certain degree, but I also think that's a deliberate tactic sometimes. Um because um the same reason why they hide in dog excuse me, in dog whistles and irony. Um, and uh, I mean, I think it was, uh, who, who the fuck was it? Was it, um, God, fuck, I always forget who it was who wrote about this, about the anti-Semite, like debating the anti-Semite. Was that um, Voltaire? Oh, John Paul Sartre. Or Sartre, so, 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 yeah. Um, um, yeah, like, like, like that's that, that was a problem in his time as well. So it's like, yeah. I think it's something they always use. And yeah, I think that like... Um, I, I do think you're right to a degree um, that like we failed to acknowledge that part of uh, uh, we failed to acknowledge that part of, of this sort of fascist ideology where, where it peddles itself in fantasy and misinformation and stuff that seems clownish to the outsider. But when you're in that zealous mindset, mm. 
it it doesn't say i mean and and you could even take this to analyze like to a certain analysis of christianity too right because i mean when you hear a preacher um and you're not in there and you hear a preacher talking about oh spiritual warfare there are angels and devils hovering over our children fighting back and forth for their souls um most people would kind of laugh at that like have a bit of a chuckle like that's ridiculous right but these people believe it 100% and when you're in that, when you're being constantly reinforced and you're being told this is reality, people get into a zealous mindset. And I do think it's important to both humanize and recognize that, like, these things are somewhat ridiculous. It's a very hard line to walk, for sure. Yeah. But um, um, I completely agree with you, but there's one thing that I would disagree with, and it's it's when you're describing that it looks cartoonish to the outside. We think that we and liberals are on the outside. No, we the left are on the outside to liberals that just looks like power doing its thing because one of the things about fascism is just it's a response to how the status quo can just maintain its power so they'll find a reason to ignore it. it's as uh, Zizek has talked about how ideology in the modern day is radical cynicism sorry radical skepticism of like sure Trump is just you know ignore him he's he's like that's the basic liberal mindset now COVID has made it very difficult to follow that. So the veneer is starting to break a little. Yeah. But um, this is one of the things that I just noticed over the past decade. Um, what, one of the things about how ideology has just possessed neoliberalism is that it's in your interests to not notice fascism. And yeah. fascism has always, always played off of this. And it's only those who notice it get the caricature. Um, we see how amusing and just stupid it is. Um, <clears throat> but to most people, they don't have materialist analysis of society. They have a very kind of like idealized folklore. If you believe in the American dream, fascism doesn't look that strange to you. Fascism just looks like the American dream with a few compromises. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. Like, I think that's a really complicated t subject too, because hmm. in some ways I feel like um, part of the failure um of like of like i don't know i guess of the stigmatization of fascism and, and nazism it was was um playing their own game and just fixating on the aesthetic you know where it's yeah. like ah yeah like you said like literally goose stepping down the street whereas like right now the way that the way that donald trump is going about governing is essentially the same it's the same that we've seen in any fascist dictator in the past it's just a different color you know but because people fixated so much on like the 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 shiny you know leather boots and the skulls on the um on on the lapels and whatnot and lapel pins or whatever but then again but then i like i look at sean hannity wearing a, a yeah. blue lives matter punisher skull and i'm like is it really that different is it just that people are too confounded by like how cartoonish it is like because i feel like uh like it almost requires uh like a, a really like like an induction of, co of of like cognitive dissonance in order for people to be like oh look at how bad like antifa is and they wear black clothes and then to but then to yeah. go and turn on sean hannity and he has a literal uh blue lives like thin blue line skull and it's just like this guy's wearing a skull, like a, a skull for the Punisher, a guy who was known for killing and torturing um, his, you know, his victims uh, in the name of justice. A character that was an anti, like an anti-hero for the purpose of critiquing, um, you know, designed for the purpose yeah. of critiquing, like what it means to be like what what happens if you have a guy with a ton of power who can just do whatever he wants. Um, and I don't know. It's so hard to actually like figure out what it what the exact function is and like what it is that ca causes um I don't know causes that that inability to recognize like hey like you can't really be calling people just wearing black the villains when your guy you're like the main guy that represents the face of your news is wearing like a Punisher pin that implies that the police should be more like the Punisher like. Oh, I don't 100%, know. Yeah. It, it is definitely confounding. I think that's something that like, I still need to learn more about myself. Um, you know, is, is sort of figuring out how to demystify this stuff in the t context of debate. For sure though, if you can make somebody with a, with a, uh, a punisher pin look like a clown, um, like, uh, that's going to be, it's going to be pretty good. 
and they're not going to be able to come back from that particularly easily and they will also get very angry and it will be really funny because that inevitably happens once you start winning in a debate you will see just how angry um a a uh, somebody who relies entirely on controlling the narrative will get it's just incredibly funny um so yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we completely agree on this point, because it was like um, it was Walter Benjamin who uh, basically coined the phrase like fascism tends towards the aestheticization of politics. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, like what we're getting at is the idea that fascism treats politics as art and it produces um, like it, it's uh, its products. What it actually paints is fascism and people only learn to recognize like the the art of 100 years ago we don't because uh, exactly like you said yep. um today it's just it's it's the goose step except they're not doing it down the street he's doing it on twitter the problem is people they did they never learn to recognize the painter they learn to recognize the painting and, that and is this so is the in, this is why it's it, it every single leftist is familiar with the concept of you know what it's so much harder to love liberals it, it, and it, it's this it's because they just don't see it they just don't see it yeah um I, 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 this is what i'm talking about in the sense of like that i it's one of the things i'm deeply worried about is that um if if we can't manage to if we can't manage to discuss fascism in a way that uh, i don't want to humanize them either because at the end of the day they've kind of they've decided humanity isn't for them uh that's the way i often put it um, but to liberals, they'll just dismiss you. They'll think that you're just you're. Th they think you're painting fascism onto them, when in reality, we're just recognizing that they're fascist painting. Well, and um, you know, I think that's where um, that's where we come in. Like, yeah, one hundred percent. Like that's our place. Like, like not just us, but also bread tube. Like that's where um, cultural agents have the um, ha have that's our that's our playground. That's where we're. That's what we're doing here. It's like. There are mo way more liberals than there are right wingers. That's just a fact. Just like there's way more liberals than there are leftists. Liberals um, are indoctrinated in certain ways, for sure. Everybody is. Hell, even leftists have certain levels of indoctrination on certain fronts. I would say that most leftists constantly struggle against certain types of capitalist indoctrination. All right. of us do. Um, but liberals are not indoctrinated in the same way that like an evangelical extremist would be um yeah. or a catholic traditionalist would be or a um or a hard fascist or anything like this like those level that's a level of indoctrination that requires being pulled down a pipeline and constantly reinforced um and i think this is one of the things that um that does irritate me a little bit although i understand it um is is like some people are like oh liberal liberal like uh, liberals are too brain poisoned to be helped like we have to ignore them no that's the opposite of the thing yes some liberals might just not be able to get it but the vast majority of liberals are a are totally capable of being like taught new things and and being receptive to like interpreting things a new way to varying degrees of course obviously there are some oh, yeah. liberals um who are very very invested um in the current order you know what I mean? In the current status quo, I would argue like people who have a huge vested interest in it. Um, some, some like tech people who are really deeply involved in tech, um, have become like very much attached to certain neoliberal and liberal ideas, um, as a part of their identity and a part of their job and livelihood. Um, I think there's like, you know, certain pe like certain politicians, um, like, uh, like certain lawyers are very fixated in those, those liberal things. And those people might be harder to reach, but the vast majority of liberals are just working class people, um, who have yet to be given like a ton of information that could really make their lives better and help them understand the world better. Um, I consider like, I, f I feel like that's where I was a few years ago, like very much so. Like I had like certain lefty ideas that I was familiar with and comfortable with, um, but I would mostly consider myself a liberal. And um, this was like after coming out of, of like, like deconverting out of Christianity and going through that whole learning process of like breaking out of an extreme religion and coming to understand the world myself. And I kind of settled in this like, like comfortable liberalism. Um, and then I started watching like a bread tube a little bit. And then, um, like particularly ContraPoints was somebody who like really was able to reach me. 
um, because it's like I was a young, yeah, I was like very young in transit, you know, in a like early on in tradition uh, in uh, transition, and um, like uh, so contrapoints was really able to reach me, and then you know then like Sam Cedar and stuff like that, and these these people were able to get me to think deeper about um a whole lot of stuff that I had never thought about before. So I I think that like it's really important that leftists like resist the um resist the urge to write off liberals um and it, but yeah. but that doesn't mean you don't you don't you can't bully liberals a little bit it's really important because believe it or not um sometimes like being irritated at somebody not approving of you like i noticed this especially with like sock dems especially like um who tend to lean much more liberal than i would consider like you know the way i am obviously but they really want to be leftists and so there's this thing where it's like yeah. they 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 get so mad at leftists when um like a leftist dis disagrees you know with them or whatever or says that they're like a lib and they're like well I have that like oh. and it's because there's a there's that part in their brain where it's like oh I'm realizing these problems but I don't want to make the jump into like saying I'm not like in the middle like the comfortable middle anymore because that means like you know that means like recognizing I'm on a moving train and like and uh and like. I got to do something about it. So I, I think that we can use that to our advantage. We can use the fact that like um, it is becoming kind of cool to be a leftist. Um, and, and because we start, we've begun to have an actual cultural presence and we can use that. We can use that to our advantage and say, yeah, actually it is pretty cool. Here's some of the things you should think about if you're not a leftist and like, can you resolve these? Can you really do it? Can you actually like sleep easy at night knowing that like that, you know, your president it ha is maintaining concentration camps on a border and black bagging protesters who've done nothing wrong. Yeah. Um, and the reality is that a lot of them when confronted with that information and, and not just confronted, but challenged to say, can't, yeah, maybe you could put that in a memory hole and forget about it. But can you actually like keep that in your brain? Can you keep can the way that you're the, the way that you view the world is your worldview compatible with this fact? And a lot of them are going to conclude, ah, shit, no, I need to rethink things. And liberals are capable of doing that. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. They're absolutely capable. And I would say that there are some people um, who are not capable of that. Like I can say that if, if that sort of thing had come to me when I was like an extreme right winger, when I was much younger and was really indoctrinated, would have just gone right off. You know what I mean? Because it's like um, there's like a, sh a force field that prevents those ideas from ever even getting into your head. Um, it's like the faith for force field. Like, oh, that is a degenerate idea. I can rule it out completely. Um, but liberals don't have that to the same degree. Um, most of them do not, by and large. So, yeah. yeah. That was a bit of a ramble, but, you know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I've, I've always found the sock dem conversation just – frankly absolutely hilarious because it's it's a very it's a very american centric conversation because in europe we have sock dems and they don't really consider themselves leftists they consider right. themselves left leaning because they get that they like capitalism however you do get those who are kind of like it's well i'm liberal that that means we're the same and i'm kind of like you still want the exploitation of 50 percent of the planet we're not really the same but agreeing completely with you like that, um, like I, I had a conversation with President Sunday and basically the pitching selling point I said to him is I don't consider liberals a lost cause. Let's yeah. have a chat. And um, it, it mainly comes down to and it all comes down to like just like this basic phrase I have. Like I get very annoyed when people say like socialism and liberalism are totally incompatible because I usually just hit them with this. Liberalism held to its own standards is called socialism. Yeah, we already agree on pretty much everything. And and here is the part that separates liberals from socialists. Um, to me, liberals they fundamentally have a mis on no. Uh, uh, it's it's more that um, leftists are consciously aware. I, we say we're class conscious. It's that exact idea, mm -hmm. and it comes down to Marxist's concept of false consciousness. Liberals are like deep in it. Yeah. Uh, leftists, uh, and, and this is where it actually gets very uncomfortable. Leftists, like fascists, have actually shed ourselves of false consciousness where we get how bad the world is. The fascists just think that's normal because that's hierarchies playing out the way they should. Yep. And the strong rises to the top. 
and then the rest of us, you know, the people who actually still have souls, we basically go, wait, this sucks. Why is it that people have to die so one person can have seven yachts? Whereas right, liberals yeah. aren't liberals aren't even aware that this entire conversation is happening. And nine times out of ten, it's because well, they just finished their third job and the kids are screaming and they're fighting with their husband because he wanted to go to the, the Knicks game, but, you know, you couldn't afford it because, well, you had no food yesterday. And they're just exhausted. They don't have time to think about anything. Yep. So they don't. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I think there's uh, something that I've been really happy to see, um, you know, um, uh, that I've been happy to see going around with, you know, with, with, uh, you know, Michael Brooks's tragic passing recently um, was, you know, he was very focused on addressing very base material concerns. Um, yeah. And and I can't remember his ex the exact quote, the exact wording of his quote, but it was basically, you know, you can't start building socialism while there's still hungry people. Um, and <laughs> um, and. <laughs> um and it's true though like and this was actually a big part of um luna luna oi um on youtube recently released a really great video talking about uh ho chi Minh, um and how you know one of one of the things that made vietnam have a like a successful revolution in comparison to so many others was that their literal first objective was we want to feed everybody. We want to get food for everybody. And that was before anything else, even before mm. armament. Early on, it was, we're going to go uh, claim this food and give it away free because people were starving. And I think that's something that, like, um, the like the modern left, you know, could benefit from a lot is, like, realizing that a lot of the people, a lot of people are, are politically uninterested because they are barred from having the free space to be politically interested. Not because yeah. they're not like they're inherently uninterested in politics. It's just when you're constantly on a treadmill, when you're constantly um, like a few weeks away from being hungry or, a, or, or, or like a year behind on bills and you're going to be deprived of things that you need to keep your life going when you're like, um, like everything is like, there's huge, you know, you have really, really long, uh, transit times and you're just spending all your life basically getting to and from and working to and from work and then working. Like these are really big things, um, that people need to address. And I think that, um, doing so, um, in whatever way possible will actually do a really, really good, like will actually open the door to like dispelling what people sometimes call the liberal mind poison like the like the like yeah. oh that that worldview will change once people actually have time to actually think about it and the way that we do that is by enacting very specific goals and also in the meantime making room for those people who are questioning who are looking for more who are frustrated and and like want to debate and figure out what 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 the cognitive dissonance that's bothering bothering them is that's why I guess I, I, you know, I guess I agree with you pretty strongly about like not, not, uh, not writing off liberals completely. In fact, I would, I think it would be you know, a huge mistake to do so. So, yeah. I, and, and cause at other ends, you miss a gigantic opportunity sometimes by alienating liberals because, um, I, I think the presidential run of Bernie Sanders over the, the two runs, represented exactly what we're talking about because um like like he had the largest grassroots presidential campaign in the history of the united states of america yep. think about how many people before then had never even considered the idea of voting and now all of a sudden they're seeing themselves as part of kind of like a greater community of political awareness where what he did is we, he stirred in them the idea that there's more than just your own place in society. You are also a component part of your community and your communities form parts of society. And one of the things that absolutely drove me fucking spare when he dropped out was you had a huge leftist kind of cohort kind of saying that, OK, we now need to completely distance ourselves from the political process and we need to, like, attack anyone who's still considering voting. And I just sat there going, no, 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 nothing has changed. Keep going door to door. Keep building dual power structures. Get ordinary yeah. people used to talking to each other. It, it, it's... <laughs> Yeah. Don't kick them out. Keep them involved and invested. Because it's like, like the way I put it is like, even if they vote for Joe Biden, 
Get them used to the idea that they're not just thinking about their own place in society. Get them used to thinking about themselves as part of a community because then it's so much easier to pull them towards socialism when shit gets so much worse. Yeah. Imagine having to try educate them on the idea of class while they're being marched to a fucking concentration camp. Yeah. It's, like, just, it's not going to happen. It, yeah. Because it, 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 here's a phrase that I heard Slava Zizek say once that just completely radically transformed my idea about this. Um, he was saying that he often gets people say like that, um, now is the time for action. Why are we talking about how we can radicalize liberals? And he just said like that, never before in human history has it ever been this peaceful. If now isn't the time to think about what comes next, what makes you think you're actually going to have the peace of mind to figure it out during a revolution? Right. Yeah, absolutely. I, I... I agree. And I think, um, yeah, yeah, I think that's a, that's one of the things that we should take. I mean, that's what, again, that's why I, I feel like Twitch and BreadTube and all of these other um, like cultural outlets for leftism are really good. And I don't understand people who um, shut those things, like who like dunk on them. I mean, I can understand a certain amount of critique, but there's like, uh, I mean, we know like there's the, the, I think even Destiny had had a take on this recently about, oh, leftists are this and that and the other thing, and BreadTube is full of shit. But I'm just like, okay, yeah, maybe individual BreadTubers are imperfect, but the structure as a whole is incredibly valuable. Like, these are all these ideas that are explored in depth. They're analyzing media. They're analyzing texts. They're uh, talking about movies, books, all this stuff, and making sense of it to people in a way that we've never been able to have that sort of thing before. The internet has made it possible for... And un, I mean, genuinely, I don't think anybody truly has a, ha, is able to fathom just how many people have come have been able to come into contact with information that just a few decades ago would have been completely unfathomable for them to ever have come in contact with. People could oh, live yeah. their whole lives in a certain type of bubble, and that's something that's changing the world. And we need to recognize that and be willing to say, hey, maybe there's something to this. Also, on the Bernie Sanders thing. I, I am actually rather, I don't know, maybe I should, I don't know. It's hard to tell because I can't even keep track of time anymore with all the pandemic bullshit going on. Yeah. But I, I do feel a bit sad that Bernie didn't spin all of his um, organizations into something more on the ground because the communication was unbelievable. And now it's mm. just, it the energy went nowhere, you know, because his campaign was a failure. I mean, he could have, he could have brought together and tied together and united all kinds of disparate leftist organizations. Um, and I mean, to a degree, I think that's happening behind closed doors to a degree. Like, I mean, I know there's an incredible amount of support from uh, Bernie's existing, you know, campaign infrastructure, um, putting money and expertise into like local lefty campaigns. But I'm just thinking like, I mean, there's even in my town, I can think of two two groups that if they had been able to be been brought into concord somehow could be greatly could could, could benefit so it's actually three i can't even imagine like what, what could have happened if like bernie just said okay we're gonna we lost the election because of some real bullshit but here's what i'm gonna do instead i'm going to go around to every single major city in the u.s and get all of and 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 get all of their mutual aid groups talking to one another and communicating and organizing together i'm going to go and find and go to every major state and talk with their tenants union and figure out how they can get more reps maybe we can give them some of our campaign people to go out and organize um organize tenants that could change the entire world but you know but it's like it's like you know i don't know it's that like people got disillusioned with electoralism in the wrong direction mm. almost if that makes sense yeah it's like they're just like oh I'm, that means i'm not going to vote and i'm going to turn off completely it's like no realize that like the fact that that like i i went to like one of bernie's rallies here in the seattle area and seventeen thousand five hundred people showed up and it was incredibly inspiring to me i was incredibly nervous to go because i don't really love being like in loud crowded environments it was amazing. And I'm like, holy shit, these are all people who were willing to come out here. 17,000 people were willing to come out here just to like see what could be done and hear what needed to be done and make a show of make a show of force. And that is like that that is such an energy that can be that can be channeled, that can be 
put into other organizations and other things. We have to become more politically involved and in different ways and, and not fall into the trap of just funneling into, um, who, you know, who's on the ballot for president. Instead, yeah. the same group of people, those 17,000 people can, and many of them are, of course, now looking towards who's our local leaders. And um, like, like I mean, Kashama Sawant. I talk about her very frequently. Our 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 um, council, our city councilwoman, who's a socialist, socialist on like the the city council. One of the most influential members of the most of one of the biggest of the city city council of one of the biggest cities in the country. And like, holy shit, is she making moves here in Seattle? And it's really amazing. And like, all of these people, if they can find those local groups if we can start putting you know tying those connections together there actually is a base of power for the left in the united states there actually is a, yeah. a base of power for labor and turning your brain off and saying oh i've had enough um fuck voting fuck uh politics whatever like um that would be you know that's the mistake i think i feel like that's the like black pilled way to go and it's not the right way to go yeah. this is th now more than ever is the time to act to put out every signal that we can through the internet and to wake people up and say, Hey, come on, we can do this together. So, yeah. 100% because it's um, <clears throat> like, uh, my, uh, do, do you know the, the constant thing? Like it's also oh, what, what politics are you? Are you an anarchist? Are you an ML? Like blah, blah, blah. Um, my politics, I'm deeply informed by an Irish politician called James Connolly. And he gave me one of the greatest quotes I've ever heard in my entire fucking life where he said that the role of electoralism within socialism is to elect disturbers of the peace. Yep. Um, I got introduced to the idea of propaganda of the deed, which is an anarchistic uh, philosophy where you, you disrupt... Yikers! <laughs> uh, uh, you disrupt groups so as to kind of like advertise the idea that, hey, we exist. Um. I think these two things can marry together where voting as an act of protest, elect, elect a president who will absolutely shut down the office of presidency and literally just render it defunct. I mean, that's literally like, that's sort of the purpose. Uh, that's sort of the role that like Kashama Sawant has filled. Kashama Sawant yeah. was the one who used her key to let, uh, to let all of those protesters into city hall um after like the uh, during the uh protests i don't know if you heard about that um but seattle I haven't heard a thing um seattle city hall when all of the um when all the politicians came to work in the morning was full of protesters on the inside and it. that's because i love it she having a key to city hall being a city councilwoman said fuck it i'm op opening the doors so she unlocked all the doors and let all the protesters in so they had all set up yeah. camp overnight and it was one of the most like major Oh, I mean, she got so much flack for it, but oh, yeah. she's not she's not in trouble because she didn't technically do anything illegal, and they were all, then they didn't do any damage. They just hung out in there to make their voices heard, and it was incredibly effective. Also, she was on the ground over in Chaz Chop like all the time, which is another way. So I I like um while uh while um the 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 propaganda of the deed has a little bit of a different um connotation in conversations here in america um uh i i do i do generally agree i do understand the roots of it and it's uh and it, yeah. and it's um well, and its value as a, very, a concept i gave a very tame definition of yes propaganda. i was gonna say i know how i know how far it goes yeah. but like like if you know you know where it goes yeah, yeah if you don't know i've given you a very kind of like child-friendly introduction so that you might be more willing to bite the bait yeah no, but I, I mean, I largely agree. I think that like um, another concept that people like sometimes hear but don't necessarily understand is um, is uh, is uh, praxis. You know what I mean? Understanding what praxis is, and and yeah. you know, praxis is is just putting your political ideology into action, putting your political beliefs into actual action, and um, sometimes that can mean turning on stream. And say and and explaining to people and taking that time. Sometimes that means going and delivering groceries. Sometimes that means um, writing a letter. Like I mean, fuck. Like no one person can do everything. But you have to remember yeah. that like being a leftist means recognizing that we're all that we're like at the end of the day, this is only going to be possible if we do it together, and that you aren't alone. That also means that the entire pressure of the world isn't on you. We're all lifting yeah. together. Um, 
like hell. Like uh, one of the best things I've been, become plugged into that's been incredibly useful to me has been one, connecting with my local mutual aid group and two, just following like the socialist politicians in my area and they will tell you if they need help with something and as it turns out most of it can be done from your computer chair like this morning they put out a call they're like hey we need people to comment um there's they're having open public comments for the entire council the entire city council we need as many supporters as we can to submit comments i literally click the button it opens up an email you write the email to the council and then they have to read them all in their session and so i wrote a, a big letter that took me like 20 minutes took almost no time i just wrote a big letter about how i can't believe that um any that the council would even have to think twice about about um whether they should continue or stop sweeping of home of homeless encampments in the city in the middle of a pandemic and then i tied into that how i think that um this goes into an a, an overall an overall callousness that is um that has begun to characterize the seattle police force and then talked about mm -hmm. defunding because they asked oh, you know make sure you talk about defunding the police which we did and we have now a un a unvetoable um majority of of city council people that are going to defund the spd by 50 percent as long as the political will maintains that will go through and the spd one of the most notorious police departments in the entire united states will be defunded by 50 percent and and that money yeah. by the way is not just going into thin air it's being it, it by the legislation that's being put through is um is uh, going to redirect it into our local health clinics and our local mental health clinics. That is so incredible of a victory. Like, oh my God. And that was done largely by people doing very small actions together. Small actions that didn't take that. Like, I mean, a few people who are in positions of being able to do that. Like, for example, Kashama Sawan being a politician has to do a lot of like does a lot of actions herself. Um, but mm. m most of it is a lot of people just doing a little bit of what they can afford to do and, and organizing coming together and communicating is what makes it possible for that many hands, you know, that, that many hands make the work light effect to go into play. Oh, yeah. You have to just be plugged in, plug yourself in yeah. and then you can learn how to do cra praxis. Yeah. Cause two things. The first thing, just being involved in the community project that's a high that's very difficult to match. True. Uh, like it's it's a synthetic dopamine rush. It's phenomenal. The second one is wait, some it's, a, it's an organic one. <laughs> so organic. It's uh, well, technically they're all organic. But, you know, it's a different <laughs> one. Um, some follow-on praxis from this. Um, reach out to your kind of like your local union reps and literally say to them, "Hey, can you teach us in how to prepare for uh, for um, propaganda?" Because uh, like the case you have in Seattle where you are now going to become a test case for defunding the police. So it's not a matter of if, it's you are going to become the subject of an intense, intense propaganda campaign by the right wing. So learning how to prepare your members to recognize that you're being lied to by the right. Oh, and absolutely. Then you can, yeah. And you can generate links with your local unions because... Uh, this like there's um there's a YouTuber called Another Slice who did a phenomenal video about how to unionize within your workplace. Can and you this send is that one to of the, me? Uh, yeah, um, it's that's one of the key things involved in when you're unionizing, understanding that they are going to try to union bust you. Yeah, um, absolutely. No, yeah, and then it's um because here's the thing about the the left wing, all of our community projects are essentially just. It's it's the same idea with different practical applications. Uh, uh, working together as a, a work community, as a union, working together as a community is called a Soviet. And I take the Soviet idea. Working together kind of like at a state level, we call that just politics. Uh, it, but it's the same basic idea. Yeah. Uh, it's work together to recognize that um, like um, uh, the summer's greater than the, what was it? Like a, 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 there's, the summer's greater than the whole. I think that's the phrase. Oh yeah, the 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 whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and and that's completely true. I mean, the idea there being that like when you come together, like like for example, uh, an engine, an engine that has been constructed, um, can actually move a car, whereas you might have a whole bunch of pieces of an engine sitting around on the ground, and despite the fact that that is technically all of the pieces necessary for an engine, it's not until you put those pieces together 
that it becomes the, the whole and therefore the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. That's very, very much the case um, for, you know, organizing and, and um, enacting any form of political change. And it does start with a, on a small level. Deatomizing is um, actually, you know what? Hell, I'm going to give you a special look. You get a special look at, <laughs> at, at my mental chart here. There. Oh, I can't lovely. go into detail, but this is my, this is my like, uh, this has been a personal project I've been working on. Up at the top, I was like, this was like, I was trying to organize my thoughts a couple week, weeks back. At the top, I have like, okay, biggest problem I can think of, capitalism. And then I have a bunch of lines that basically explain like things that I believe or that I've been able to identify personally that I think contribute majorly to capitalism. And one of those is atomization. <laughs> And then from there, it's like, well, then what do you do about it? And it was basically just a way for me to try to organize my thoughts into saying, okay, well, what can I actually do in this horrific mess that we found ourselves in? And, yeah. um, you know, counteracting atomization is absolutely one of those things for sure. Um, and yeah, deatomizing. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that reaching out and connecting with people, um, even if all you do is just know that they're there is a great first step. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Here, I'm. I'm just gonna pop to the back room. I'll be two seconds. Sure. Yeah. No worries. <sighs> Chat. How is everybody doing? Um. How is everybody doing? Um. Any fans of Mike from PA? Um. I don't really like listening to Mike PA's Mike from PA's show, but I don't dislike him. I think he ha I think he makes some good arguments. Sometimes I've learned a few things from him. Um. I just find his. Um. I find his, personally. I find his his like stream style, a little, a bit abrasive. Um, yeah. Um, I've never seen, I didn't see Mike from PA's debate with destiny. Actually. Um, he seems to be, I don't know. Mike loves to shit stir and I don't know. That's all right. We all do to a certain degree. Uh Oh, Oh shit. What happened? Oh no. My phone. Okay. That's a bit weird. There we go. All right, fix it. That was weird. I don't know what actually happened there. Oh yeah, I fucking love talking to Zanzi. Um Zanzi's amazing. Um these conversations are always incredibly productive and yes, a little bit rambly, but generally incredibly enjoyable. Um, I'm not a fan of him because the show we are mean things he does for attention, but there are news articles and wisdom on running for office. It's really some eye openers. Yeah. I mean, he's been politically involved for a long time and he does have some insights. Um, yeah. Oh, well, I hope your work is going well, Wendelby. Um, I deeply appreciate you listening in. Really, really means the world to me. Um, uh, you're one of my favorite people to see in chat, seriously. So, yeah. All right. Welcome back. Hello, hello. Hello. Good to see you again. I'm I'm going to miss this uh, streaming setup when I move back because there's there's just something so theatric about opening the door and walking in. <laughs> but you but you'll get your whiteboard back, right? Uh, the the big whiteboard fell down in a crack, oh, so no. I replaced it with a smaller one. All the right. the problem I was having with the big whiteboard is that it had kind of like warped and beveled, so it was kind of it was coming out from the wall, which meant that it just kept falling down because the adhesive I was using just wasn't strong enough to hold it in. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. a problem no, the, with a lot of whiteboards. They they warp yeah, they, over time. The, uh, it's, it's a nightmare. Because the, the other one is I have to like write a very sternly worded letter to my ISP. Because um, y you may have noticed we've been live for like two hours and I haven't had like a single internet problem. Yeah. It's yeah. Good. That's what I, that's what I hate about where I live. Yeah. I, I need to figure out what's wrong on my internet. Um, I, I think there's um an issue... Uh, it's um, what's called a DSL issue where it's the actual line from uh, like the router to like their routers. Oh, so yeah. There's nothing, um, nothing I can do. I have to get on to them about it. I've actually had that exact issue um, at at um, 
at my old place um where I like when I was younger this was like I lived I lived in an apartment below where my parents lived and um I was getting so annoyed because we kept having these really random internet issues and as it turned out um I pestered them a whole bunch and when the repair person came I actually talked to the repair person like like one to one I was like hey listen like I don't know how much you can actually do but I know you like you guys are the ones who actually do the real repairs. I was like, can yeah. you look at the line where it connects to the house and where it connects to the telephone pole? And he was like, yeah, that's no problem. Goes up there. Sure enough, the actual rubber of the um, ar- that surrounded the cable had split. And whenever water would get in there, it would short out the Internet and cause. Yep. So that's something that can happen. Um, and literally the only way to do it is just to pester your ISP enough that they actually come out like. Yeah, because yeah, nobody else can do it, and of course they're always fucking. I don't know how bad ISPs are in Ireland, but they're really bad here. <laughs> they're, they're they're not as bad as the US, simply because Ireland is a much smaller country. Yeah. Now, however, um, in rural Ireland, it can be almost impossible to get Wi-Fi and things like that. Yeah. But um, all in all, we have a pretty decent infrastructure set up. Um, good. like the, the days of like the it, we don't have the same monopoly problem that you do. Um, that's like three the worst thing about US. Yeah. So bad. Uh, and and like, technically how they carve up the country is illegal, but it's, has there been a sitting US congressperson willing to actually call them on that shit? Nope. Nope. Unfortunately. Um, we might That might change going forward. We'll see, though. I don't know. Uh, hopefully, because as it stands right now, you basically have a choice between um, Comcast, um, Xfinity, or... Oh God, I can't even remember the other company now off the top of my head. Uh, Verizon, I think, is one of them. I don't even remember the other company. Comcast, ex- mm. Comcast used to... Jesus fucking Christ, I'm trying to remember the other company. Time Warner Cable? Yeah, I think it might be Time Warner. I don't know. Um, oh, did did my internet go out intermittently? Mine didn't. Um, but, oh, if it's like... Uh, some, sorry, somebody in my chat mentioned this. Um if it was, yeah, it was like, it would be co- almost completely random. Um, and then I started to notice that it was like, um, when my internet would go out, it was almost always when either the wind was blowing or it was raining. Um, and mm. that was what got me to like, tell the repair person, like, Hey, can you actually check the cable itself? Because that might be where the problem is because they weren't finding any problem in our house. Yeah. If you're having yeah. a person in my chat who mentioned that, if you're having that problem, absolutely talk to them about verifying the integrity of the lines to and from your house because that might be the issue um yeah if nothing else seems to be working that could be it yeah for sure yeah um, and because here's one of the issues as well <clears throat> that like uh, unless you're in the know you'll never know these things um i used to be a laptop repair technician so i had to kind of look into these ideas i uh, one of the most annoying thing about the internet connection is that it was built on a network designed to carry telephone signals. So it's already not built for what it's being asked to do. But if there's one thing capitalism is fucking phenomenal at doing, <clears throat> it's jerry-rigging and hacking systems to basically invent profit out of nowhere. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, then that's that's the, the case here too. It's like completely, um, yeah, completely um, inconsistent, like, <laughs> infrastructure. It's the internet infrastructure. I had a friend who was literally like a high level engineer doing um, cellular stuff. And they've, they said that uh, after a nearly catastrophic um, outage in the Southern States of the United States, where they were literally flown on short notice down to go address problems. um, They were Hmm. like, once I looked into there, I don't think I'll ever be able to look at like, at like the internet in the United States. Again, the entire United States internet infrastructure is held together by duct tape and paper clips. (laughs) And they were like, it's the worst thing I've ever seen. Um, I love it. Yeah. It's terrifying to think about, but hopefully that those days will be behind us at some point and we'll, we'll build some actual like, um, you know, purposefully designed infrastructure that isn't just an afterthought, you know, to try and justify as much profit as possible. Um, yeah. Because, I mean, that um, is... Because yeah. <clears throat> uh, I, I could be, like, very badly representing the story, but this is how it was explained to me. <clears throat> um, in Ireland years ago, there was a phone company called O2, which um, built a lot of, like, the phone masts and things like that in Ireland. <clears throat> So then when you had kind of like the competition companies come in, 
uh, the infrastructure costs of setting up um, uh, kind of like phone masks was huge. And then there was the question of like, do you have like two masks ne next to each other? So like um, uh, the other phone companies like Meteor and like Vodafone went to the Irish government and said, um, hey, the network is there. Can we use it? And O2 said, no, we built it. And the Irish government went, no, this is a national asset. You have to give them access. Yeah. Yep. And we had so, basically the opposite happen yeah. here, which was yeah. like, uh, we've been caught in limbo <clears throat> about that same exact style of decision as to whether um, it's classified as like a, a national utility or whether they can gatekeep it. And we have like, basically all that I can describe it is like a, like a jungle gym built like around refusing to actually determine whether it's a public it's a public right like that infrastructure should yeah. be public and or whether uh they can gatekeep how they want and that's why there's been this like ongoing battle here in the states over net neutrality uh which is just like <laughs> i can't even get into it anymore it's become so complicated and messy that like and of course during um you know, during this whole Trump admin, it's just been, uh, no progress has been made. It's just been forever stymied. Um, oh, yeah. With, of uh, course, Mordor, go ahead. Uh, Mordor Warg in my chat just said like that O2 gets to charge them surely. As far as I know, they are allowed to do like a rental fee, but they're not allowed to deny access to the network. Um, it's similar. I think US, the rail system is the same way where like, uh, if like a rail company builds a railroad, they can't actually deny another company access. They can just charge them a fee. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, that, I think that's how most of the, um, like, uh, public, uh, like new, <clears throat> neutral utilities, um, in the United States that, that were like heavily invested by a single company. I think that's the resolution yeah. that the government's come to on most of them, except for apparently internet, um, <laughs> which is a, a mess, an absolute mess. Yeah. And, oh, it's so invasive. Like, um, it's it's literally gotten significantly worse under Trump. Um, we're to the point now where um, it is literally a regular occurrence for um, your hardware to be messed with remotely oh, yeah. by your ISPs. It's terrible. As in, like, um, one of the things that happened was uh, we happened to be, like, slightly overdue on one of our bills. And we didn't even know because it just like it was like a random charge that happened to be on there. And so we paid our usual amount and there was like a leftover balance. And um, I tried to reset the router. And when I reset the router, their system was like, ah, like you're overdue. So they factory reset our modem, which I had done my own settings and customization had to completely rebuild my network this exact yeah. same thing happened to my happened to one of my partners who doesn't live with me and um she had a way more complex network set up because they have a ton of devices on their network had to start yeah. from square one and reset up everything it's incredibly frustrating and they're just allowed to do that right now they're just allowed to literally put their fingers in your shit and if they don't like it they'll just brick your router it's terrible. So, so like, so like, they don't even deny you access. They just fuck with it. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, they just completely that's mess some with it. That's some mafia shit. It, right it's there. genuinely <laughs> horrible. I could, I could go on all day about some of the nightmares we've run into and some of the hor horrific shit. I literally um, tipped off a journalist about some of the stuff that we experienced at the hands of of uh, fucking some of these internet companies. It's so bad. It's they're so out of control right now. So yeah. yeah. Now, uh, this actually perfectly, it, I was leading over here, the mic's over here. Um, this actually perfectly ties into something like things like internet access in the US. If you're debating someone who's like a libertarian, who's like, well, no, no, this is phenomenal. They're providing a service. You don't have to even pretend to be nice to this person because the audience thinks they're the scum of the earth. Where yeah. <laughs> being an asshole is actually advantageous to you in this situation. Yeah, you, absolutely. You don't come across as an asshole doing it. And like, Ironically, I actually think this is where bernie let himself down where he was he was just a giant teddy bear at times where one of the constant yeah. critiques i heard was that he could have just been harsher and like like a good example of when you're talking about that we can bully libs is a good example of that when somebody who is um their public persona is where they're considered liberal but in reality they're not like elon musk has gone face off techno fascist uh. so you can bully the ever-loving shit out of him be an asshole because liberals are starting to kind of get that they don't really see eye to eye with him. Well, also, you can sort of um, capitalize, to use a funny term, but you can kind of uh, you can kind of capitalize on the fact that, like, a lot of people feel uh, 
betrayed they shouldn't but they do they Mm. feel betrayed by the fact that like they were like oh he was supposed to be our libertarian god and as it turns out he's just a techno fascist and it's like yeah yeah, but people do feel that and and i think you can talk about that like i mean i did an entire stream on elon musk and i will be doing another one because it's going to be it's one of my funnest one of my favorite people to give a, a digital swirly to is elon musk elon musk is like god i have met so many elon musk stands over the yeah. years it drives me up a wall i cannot even i can't even oh my god i i can't stand elon musk stands it's oh it's enough to make me completely lose it um because yeah. one of the funniest ones that i remember is that uh, me and zarel were in your chat and one person just came in and they were like absolutely standing elon to the fucking walls where they said something along the lines of that um like oh oh but he like he invented this battery so zarel had a look at the patent he's not even mentioned anywhere yet. yes i recall this i recall that ex- yeah. that exact stream i think that was also the stream where i drew my idea for the zoom food which i still have here <laughs> oh um, yes yeah, that was amazing my 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 original patent for the zoom food there yeah you go. there you go Jesus. Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah I'm going to be it, doing another one of those soon. So I hope, Oh, Oh, thank you so much. Somebody in my chat said they really liked that stream. Yeah. I'll, I'll be doing <laughs> another one. We have all kinds of new Elon Musk stuff to cover. I've been, I've been filling yeah. up a big fat folder full of Elon Musk shit to talk about. So we'll have another one soon. Um, yeah. yeah. Cause it's, um, I, I actually come to think of it. That is really good advice for other lefties. If you stream or if you think about doing content uh, as you're just, surviving on twitter that's the best way i can put it just have a little folder somewhere where you just like put links in there it's like when i'm in a state of mind to really deal with this shit just come back to it oh yeah i have uh i i i have a big folder that's just called the debunk folder and (laughs) um anytime there's like somebody who i feel is like always in the public eye and they've done something i'm like ah it's time to save it and dump it in there for later. Like I have, yeah. I have a huge folder of like Andy Neo stuff that I want to do at some point. It's just like, I got to get it all together and, and make it make sense. Um, but yeah, so I do agree though. Like, I think like a lot of people are going to start in the future are going to start seeing the real faces of a lot of these like oh, yeah. h- highly worshipped, like technocratic type people. And we got to be there to help them see it. Yeah. Because, uh, because, um, because I I know you're in Washington State, so mm-hmm. you, you would have that little bit of a bias because it tends to be more Democratic leaning. What is the general feeling in the U.S. at the moment, though? Because I am noticing a lot of libertarians are desperate. I say libertarian to be the right wing as libertarians. Yeah. I see the right wing are desperately trying to say that oh the polls it's it's like Hillary. The polls don't know what they're talking about. When some of the polls I see, it's like it's looking like the Republicans are collapsing. Um. It's looking like the Republicans are collapsing. Um, like, I'm not an expert, but as yeah. far as I understand, like, I'm not an expert, like, poll reader, but as I understand it, um, it's so, it's looking so much better for Trump, right? I mean, for Biden right now than it yeah. was for Hillary. Like, I mean, by a large margin. Like, he's getting hit, Trump is getting his ass kicked in the polls. Now, um, I don't know. Like, a lot can happen. I think that, um, I think that if, I mean, Donald Trump is literally talking about postponing the election. Um, So who knows at this point? Um, I think that, like, we can't really call it, um, but I think we can. I think it's safe to conclude that um, Donald Trump is very much unliked by and large on this country. He has a very small, very, very zealous base of support. um, But that's about it. Um, Beyond that, he like. Uh, it, it, it is a giant polarization for sure. Um, but it's just like, um, oh, Kez says hi. I uh, was waiting for a pause so that I could say it for them. Yeah. Um, oh, I love Kez. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, They're good people. Yeah, they are. And, um, but yeah, I don't know. And like, um, like here in Washington, like I don't think you could find more like revulsion and rejection of people like Jeff Bezos and stuff like that. I mean, the entire city is coded in anti Jeff Bezos um, 
graffiti and stuff like everywhere oh, yeah. even like i don't even live in the city center and like where i live there's just graf- anti anti jeff fuck jeff bezos fuck jeff bezos fuck all over the place it's everywhere they fucking hate the guy and i mean i completely understand why um he's completely like ruined um the state's economy um yeah and it's just like uh, there's like the, the Trump Trump's like avid supporters have become more rabid than ever before, but they haven't grown in numbers like at all. Yeah. Now who knows? Things might change. I mean, um, something I like, I have a whole bunch of stuff I want to cover on stream sometime this week about like him building a citizens militia out of I like ice is starting to train a citizens. Um, like what's it called? I can't remember the exact terminology used. Uh, but basically it's a citizen's militia. They're training citizens on how to um, like be conscientious about illegal immigrants. And they're in, that includes training them on how to use arms. It's incredibly, incredibly fucked. And these are the sorts of things where I'm like, um, um, like this means that the polls might not matter. Like, you know, <laughs> but yeah. So, so we're, we're getting a Christian locked basically. <laughs> it's definitely yeah uh, yeah like i mean um it's pretty terrifying it is out like like certain uh, i don't even know like certain parts of it is just like i don't even know what to say it's like out of my scope as a random twitch political commentator to be able to say like uh but i mean who else is gonna do it i guess but it's also like i mean we're looking at like again numbers from cbc uh, from cbs were published um on this was on a major news platform this hit national news was like finally a major news source reporting on the um on the actual numbers of the eviction crisis and it's like Mm. um the the like the low the state the lowest state or the state with the lowest um at-risk population meaning people who cannot pay rent and will and are only protected by eviction protections that are currently in place um oh good night kez i hope you have a wonderful night um and uh but like the lowest is like 23 percent. the lowest in the entire united states is 23 percent of the renting population that can't um that uh that um can't or that's only being protected um by eviction protections which are going to expire um up to 50 percent of the renting population of the united states um up to 50 percent is is looking at eviction in the next as is going to be staring down eviction in the next couple of days um so that combined with um a mass surge of federal agents into major cities large uh, all of which are democratic um which are directly those those armies those uh the, that surge of federal agents are being directly used to repress the first amendment um rights of the people they're attacking press this has been well documented and then the idea that ice which is basically um the most loyal organization to trump like statistically um uh the fact that all three of those things are rising in such rapid it's genuinely incredibly disturbing um and i don't know i have no clue what the united states will look like at the time of the election in november and even more so what america will look like um at the time um of january 2021 when biden would uh, be set to st- take office if we're going by polls the chances of of trump pulling out a win are so much lower than hillary that it would take a miracle um um his chances were were low against hillary but still well within the realm of possibility um this is like he's losing even in states he normally wins he's losing in swing states really hard um and his his like approval ratings are really bad um like even among republicans his handling of coronavirus is considered quite bad so i don't know it's really hard to say where this country is going and what's going to happen um in the words of contrapoints it's extremely hard to focus on anything um when uh the democracy american democracy might collapse in t-minus three months so (laughs) yeah yes because it's um i i i sent you a picture in um discord which is it's using um it's using UK housing figures, but I think the numbers are comparable. And the reason I love this image, I shared it in my chat, but the reason I love this image is because 
it correlates with so many political variables. Yep. It correlates with Republican versus demographic, uh, 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 Republican demographics. It correlates with socialist versus fascist co- demographics. It uh, correlates with conservative versus liberal demographics. Really pointing out that the people who are at risk literally don't have access to the wealth required to survive the risks. Yep. Uh, it's uh, terrifying. The caption that I... The caption that I put on Twitter when I shared this was, remind me again how young people renting isn't a problem. Yep. Yep. Um, it, yeah, it's it's pretty terrifying. And honestly, yeah. like, the thing, the thing that um, really scares me too right now is, like, um, in, 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 in another time, perhaps, um, this, or in a different age, this, you know, it might be possible for a decent amount of at-risk people to weather this type of storm but we're more atomized than ever and large swaths of um of um like our society have been alienated from like families and and stuff like every every, almost every single queer person that i know has no fallback at all like it would be considered a bad thing to like lose your apartment and have to go move back with your parents but most of these people don't have parents to move back with they lose their apartment it's to the street and um yeah yeah, it's um it's pretty spooky um and i don't know uh it feels like we're being um accelerated towards a wall because um donald trump and the and the republicans don't care they don't seem to care they're in complete denial of the fact of these problems um i mean literally just today uh, or yesterday rather yesterday night um the senate failed to um come to uh, failed to come to a agreement on unemployment um on a national level so unemployment uh payments have expired um mm. they just expire they're expiring tomorrow over the weekend and um the earliest that the senate will be able to uh, to adjourn to like or to like come together i think that's the right word adjourn uh, or is that the end? I can't remember. But regardless, the next time they'll be able to come together will be on Monday. Um, and there's, there's no guarantee they'll come to a conclusion then. So until Monday and and then however, if if the, let's assume that they come to a conclusion on Monday and are able to renew protections, it will take time for that law to actually be affirmed and put into law and then for the in- yeah. infrastructure to restart itself. And in that time, they could have literally yesterday just put they could have put a two week extension um but no they didn't put any extension so as of now there are a bunch of people who will not be receiving a paycheck next week um rent is due um at the latest um in five days in every single rental property in the united states yeah and And a lot of people will not be getting paid but today or or next week yeah and and there's there's two things immediately is one I'm pretty sure just like delaying or like helping people out is within the powers afforded to executive actions. Oh, and absolutely. Two, it would be so easy for just um, if there was like um, I, I think it's congressional approval for states to just issue moratoriums on rent. I, like like it it's not like there aren't solutions, but the problem is these solutions are weakening the. The I, I'm going to get abstract for a second it's here. Okay. Um, it's weakening the ideological hold people have to the idea that a landlord is a necessary part of the system because what we're seeing right now is they are just a middleman. If you can't pay your rent but you still have a house, do you see where I'm going with this? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what's the need for the landlord if you can't if what's the need for the landlord if you still have a house when you don't pay your rent so they have a vested interest in making sure that this doesn't go on for a long time because it's slowly weakening their ideological conditioning that landlords are just a thing you do um but but one thing i also just kind of like want to reassure people in your audience kind of like any americans who are in mine um the odds of like the odds of Trump trying to stay in office, like a year and a half ago, we laughed at the idea that he wouldn't leave. Now it's becoming very likely. 
um, the odds of him being able to are actually incredibly low. First of all, if he tries to yep. delay the idea of the election, it's actually in the Constitution that the president has to vacate the, the White House and a president has to be inaugurated uh, on like wh whatever. It's like it's in the Constitution. Yep. Um, there is something set up so that if there is no president elected, it's like the longest serving member of the Senate immediately takes uh, the um, office of presidency until an election can be held. Um, the other aspects, we fucking hate it, but the Electoral College will still vote Democrat right now. Um, so we still end up with a Democratic win in that regard, where we don't like the de we don't like the Electoral College, but it might work in our benefit here. And then the last one, this is fun to think about when you're not in the United States. Uh, this is me with my comfy detachment, but this is a very real thing. If Trump doesn't leave the White House after the, uh, the date, he is technically occupying a military complex. Yeah. It is actually in the Constitution that the U.S. Army has to go in to remove him. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that I, this is the thing that makes me, um, okay, it, it makes me scared, but in a very specific yeah. type of fear. Because it's like, um, I think Donald Trump realizes that he, his options are running out. Um, that oh, yeah. he's completely burned up any goodwill that he had. Um, only his most fervent supporters, which are a minority, are the ones who are still around. Um, and yeah. now he's pulling out all the stops in hopes to prevent the inevitable loss of the election. Um, and I don't know where that goes from here. Um, I don't think that, um, like, I mean, he has no chance of, there's no way that he maintains power. Um, and it's, it's, it's literally, that's foolish. He, there's no way, not even the military fully supports him. Um, however, the amount of damage that could be done from him, even trying to hold on to power, um, it, it could be very, very great. Um, and the people who will suffer the most are those populations that are already most in danger. Um, undocumented yeah. people, um, houseless people, um, you know, trans people who, who have, um, already been targeted, um, I mean, we saw that that uh, black bagging in New York um, recently, I'm sure um, tra random, tr random trans person picked out of a crowd um, and dragged away into an unmarked van by NYPD. Um, pretty terrible. Um, so that 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 um, that, that like a uh, desperate like attempt to hold on to power um, combined with like the absolutely hateful rhetoric that him and his supporters employ is very dangerous. And I have no doubt that it will have a blood cost. Um, should he decide to keep accelerating towards this wall? It's just, we're what we're, what we're about to find out is how far, um, the, the, uh, the Republican party and, and, and the Trump yeah. administration can glide without any wings. Basically is basically what we're, yeah. what we're getting at at this moment. And it's, it is scary. Um, it's just, I mean, he doesn't have, I don't, I don't believe, I genuinely do not believe he has the power for like a, um, like a Germany style takeover. Um, there just isn't yeah. the political will and power. He doesn't have like a military that's blindly loyal to him. In fact, the military is very split on Trump. Um, oh yeah. So, and that goes all the way up to the leadership. I mean, he has a lot of enemies within the military, so I don't think it's the same thing. I just, I do fear what the um, sort of like death throws, what costs that will have on people. Oh, yeah. And also what um, his railroading of, of, of COVID, like just ignoring COVID and leading it, to, leading us to just unfathomable levels of infection alongside the economic crash that comes with that. I don't know what that's going to look like. Um, but yeah, that's think, terrifying. Yeah, it is scary. It's, it's very scary, but yeah, Donald Trump, I don't think yeah. has the, uh, there's always a possibility that four months from now that will change. I mean, I think that um, we could look at a, a, a fundamental change of government in or, or fundamental change of our way of life in four months. Um, if if the Republican Party can muster the political will to um, completely avoid any um, any unemployment, any eviction relief, anything like that. I don't know. That could change things a lot um really quickly i just still don't think that it that yeah. it's going to go in the direction that he wants it to i think it's much more likely to go in a very chaotic direction um as opposed to any sort of like imposition of 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 uh of supreme order i think it's more likely going to be just like 
mass chaos for a while until somebody can come in to provide relief to the sick and dying people of the United States. So, yeah. And and this actually is one of those situations where I would reach out, uh, reach out. I would reach out to my friends who are anarchists because these sort of conditions are actually where like you're in your element of like, how do we create community bonds out of just nothing? Whereas um, I'm more like a theoretical Marxist. I want to try to identify solutions. I'm totally out of my depth in this situation. And it's identifying in those situations where like, know who to trust and develop those community bonds yeah. um but uh uh one thing that i want to introduce that it's the little jarring detachment for a second okay. um if liberals are if liberals are still wondering about trump being a fascist uh this is one of the situations where i bring forth him um i just i posted a link in my chat um what i'll do is i'll post a link in the discord as well in oh, case cool. you want to um, yeah, send it cool. off but it's also a, it's a really handy thing to have on uh, hand as well because it's um, uh, there's a political ah, yes. uh, philosopher called um, Umberto Eco. Mm-hmm. Uh, his f- common features. Number eight is the enemy is but strong and weak. I identified this in Trump and oh my God, it's just it's as clear as day. COVID is about not a problem. We can just open the country up. There's no problem at all with COVID. But it is also so damn dangerous that we can't have an election. Yep. Yeah. It this is so strong like, and weak. We we actually did. I did a stream. I think it's still up in my vods where we went over um the these rules, the Umberto Echoes yep. um points, and th- there's basically like all all of them. He basically hits all of them. Um, he yep. plays to almost every like identifier of fascism that you can imagine and and so yeah i do think that stuff like that is is helpful um especially but i also think it's important to like to follow up on like our debate stuff like it's it's right. it's important to not just like leave it in the realm of theoretical to like, oh, go yeah he is i guess theoretically a fascist like no he the way he's enacting like combine the knowledge that he hits all of these 14 points with the fact that he's literally operating the worst the worst border camps uh that we've ever seen in our country um horrific conditions that he's um encouraging um like the liberation of individual states like remember uh that whole thing everybody yeah. forgot about a few months ago and then he's also um giving a surge of federal troops literally a troop surge yeah. in our own country to the cities of his political opponents where they are um illegally arresting people um for the purposes of terrifying people yeah that when you combine those two you're able to make a pretty scary point that does that that shaking thing that I was talking about of people going, hey, hello, you can't just leave this in theoretical land. This is in your face now. Can you go to bed knowing that you're standing by while this is happening? Um, And a lot of them can't, as it turns out, because there's more good, in my opinion, there's more good people than bad people. Oh, 100%, yeah. And it's it's something for like the lefties in the the chat because it's very difficult to know this unless you know about fascism and how it presents there actually is no such thing as the theoretical le- uh, leftist. There is no such thing as the theoretical fascist because fascism is action for action's sake. Fascism will never like present itself in the abstract. It'll do something, and then the consequences of the action is what fascism is. Um, it, it, it's it's there's a I can't remember who it was who said it, but it was along the lines of like fascism is a death cult for this very reason because it can't theoretically figure out how to gain uh, control of the reins of power it just does for for it, the sake of doing it because it's like um uh, like one of the characteristics attached to it is that they consider thinking to be the an act of weakness right so they will do and because they avoid thinking they are incapable of entering the realm of the theoretical um so it's like like if if somebody was to say well well i guess when you think about it that way trump could be a fascist that's when you have to not allow that to annoy you because they just literally don't understand fascism yet that's where you kind of steer them towards like you just said well look what he's done look at this look at this look at this where it's like walk them through the idea that fascism is action for the sake of action's sake absolutely yeah 
it's really important to, to make those ties. That's something that I've been working on personally is, um, yeah. is getting better at giving concrete examples of the things that I'm talking about. Not just like, Oh, look at what, look at what Trump did in the news. He's such a fascist. No, look at what he did. Here are a bunch of core, a, a bunch of, of, of points of data that you can look at that all point to the exact same thing. And do you not think he's going to do the next step? You, if you can conclude what the next step is, then surely the guy who's been doing all these steps so far can as well. Um, yeah. And yeah, you you have to kind of make people realize like, oh God, like what would a brute do in this situation? Well, that's what he's going to do. And it might be your town that's next. And you need to take that seriously because, um, you know, uh, you, you know, Portland is, is a rowdy bunch. There's a lot of rowdy anarchists in that town. Um, but I bet that none of them predicted that um, 2020 would contain 55 consecutive days of protests um, with increase yeah. with with constant sh like like literal constant gassing by the state police and now gassing beatings um, unknown chemicals arguably there's there's a, a whole bunch yeah. of inquests going into what's actually been used on the ground because there's some evidence that it's uh, might not actually be um, tear gas um, that's being used in Portland anymore or that it may be expired tear gas munitions that have decayed into a toxic chemical um, which is really scary to think about um, yeah. but like I mean um, this there's nothing stopping like Every single person I know who lives in a major um, urban area has now had to experience this 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 sort of shit. Yeah. Um, every town, every major city. I mean, not like um, some small cities even got impacted by it. Like um, the town I live in, which is like a a suburb of the main of the or not even a suburb. It's like it's like a borough of the greater Seattle area. We're not where any of the protests were, and we got put on curfew for like three nights in a row. We had military and police helicopters flying low over residential neighborhoods just because. Yep. Um, this shit it's is coming. All intimidation. Yeah, it's intimidation tactics. But you have to be able, like, we're going to have to realize what it is that will make you survive intimidation tactics. And like you said earlier, the the anarchists know that pretty well. Um, and yeah. as it turns out, a lot of that is literally just taking care of your neighbors, and not just your neighbors, but the people around you that you care about, and taking care of your communities in a very material way. And if you can find a way to plug into that, um you would be surprised how much resilience can come from knowing that you have someone to call if shit hits the fan. So, yeah. <clears throat> yep. Uh, no, it is, it's 10 minutes to midnight, so I'm going to have to leave you go very soon. That's all right. Um, two, two things that I want to say. The first one, um, for anyone in the audience, um, if you ever have access to the opportunity, figure out a place of like common land and just plant a crap ton of vegetables and learn how to make soup. Because yes. if push comes to solve, if solve, if push comes to shove, uh, soup is incredibly nutritious. And if you're setting up kind of like community groups that need to rely on each other because I don't know, like a thermonuclear fascist war, whatever, um, soup is a phenomenal way of looking out for each other. Um, just develop these little ideas. Um, the last thing that I want to say that I've just found absolutely fucking hilarious while I've been watching the whole National Guard thing is that, number one, um, the state's rights people have been very fucking quiet. And two, all of the characteristics that the right wing talks about why they have an issue with Antifa, they don't seem to have any problem with the National Guard. It's a uniformed group of unidentified uh, people terrorizing communities. Oh, and it's not even the and National I, um, Guard in this case. Yeah, in uh, in Portland, for example, yeah. it's not even the National Guard. It's even worse. The National Guard is at least um, at least at the end of the day, like they have to listen to the governor. These are straight up like Department of Homeland Security agents who've been given weapons and armor and said, OK, on Trump's orders, you're going there. And the governor cannot get rid of them. Like there's literally a, a case right now where the governor of Port of uh, of Oregon um, which is where Portland is located for those of you who, who aren't in the um, United States. Um, they are considering, they have considered calling in the national guard to get rid of the feds. Think about that. <laughs> that is something that yeah. is on the table right now for the state of Oregon. That is unfathomable. Like if you had asked somebody whether this sort of thing would happen, um, like, like, like a year ago, it would have been laughable. And yet yeah. here we are.
So, all right. If, if you if you wrote this down on a page of A4 paper, went back in time five years, handed it to a, a publisher, they would have said, tone that the fuck down. It's unrealistic. It's unrealistic. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. Well, yeah. And Sunzi... it, it just... It... Oh, no, I was just going to say, uh, go ahead and finish your thought, and then we'll go from there. Uh, the last thing I was going to say is that it ties into the idea that like that when you're debating the right wing, in a lot of cases, like the hip- uh, the hypocritical nature of what we've been talking about there about how like we're the states' rights crowd, um, you know the uh, people with the uh, fucking the uh, homeland security people, often a lot of their arguments are based in confirming the way they're looking at it there's no consistency at all to their arguments where a really good tactic to use is just to point out the hypocrisy understanding that like hypocrisy isn't an answer it isn't an argument in and of itself but just point out how consistently they do it and that can be a really good avenue towards destroying their arguments yeah absolutely and i think that like especially now especially i mean um, on a panel I was just on, I th- this wasn't even me. This was Dylan Burns who got this one off. Dylan mm. Burns confronted um, someone where th- they had just been talking about how um, they are so against the, the 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 Chinese Communist Party and the authoritarian um, actions, and then literally in the next topic was like, "But wait a minute, you just defended Trump black bagging protesters. Like what the fuck? Yeah. Like." <laughs> How could you say that in the same sentence? And that does destroy credibility. Yeah, well, yes, it oh, was. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody in my chat got was like got the name of the person who was making that argument. And it's like, yeah, it is. It can be. Um, it isn't. A, you're right in that it isn't an argument in and of itself, but it can be a really good um, stone to start building a yeah. good argument off of. You just have to make sure you follow through and give an alternative. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, well, Zanzi, That's it's exactly been. It fucking fantastic speaking with you as always um um is there anything else you want i mean you should plug yourself to my audience and then i can do one to your audience i guess i mean i think we have a pretty big over overlap but oh yeah i think in my twitch analytics you're like the this the second biggest person that my audience overlaps with yeah but it's um i yeah i've i've absolutely loved chatting to you i i always do i think this is our fourth time chatting and it's uh, to me it's our first time chatting because every other time the internet has basically gotten in the way but uh no I, I'm, I'm in jest i'm in jest i actually love chatting to you mama yeah. um my name is zanzi i'm an irish um republican socialist it's very funny to say that to americans because ye have a very you don't know what republicanism is the best way i put it <laughs> we do not um, it's true i my my theoretical foundations are in Marxism, uh, but I follow James Connolly, who's a syndicalist. So I have a very kind of like I get the Marxist Leninist, but I also have an anarcho syndicalist side. So I'm I, I can resolve anarchism with statism. Uh, I think they're integral to each other personally. So I reach across the aisle in a lot of cases where like uh, the best way I can describe it sometimes is like the role of the state isn't uh, isn't leftist infighting. That's a very, very relevant discussion because it's integral to where we go. But if there's a Nazi in the room, we agree. OK, we'll just we'll not talk about that now. Uh, let's get the Nazi. Um, <laughs> that's basically what I advocate for. It's the idea that we need each other because we both want the same damn thing. Uh, communism is anarchistic. Uh, every ML knows this. So we want the same damn things. And I'm not preaching some like leftist unity bullshit. It's literally, it's, hey, right now, fascism is re-emerging. We can figure out what to do after we've beaten it. Yep. Oh, yeah, I couldn't uh, couldn't agree anymore. Everyone in my chat, please follow Zanzi. Zanzi is amazing and does super, super interesting deep dives on a fucking crazy amount of topics. I've learned so much from Zanzi. So please give Zanzi a follow and spend some time in Zanzi's chat because um, you'll have a good time. I know a lot of you already do follow Zanzi. So. And I guess I can shout, shout myself out to your chat, which is, uh, you know, I'm Demon yeah. Mama, um, Demon Mama Live on Twitch um, and uh, your Demon Mama on Twitter. I talk about a whole lot of stuff, do a lot of political var- variety, do a lot of debates um, these days. Um, and then I tend to do streams where I kind of talk about news and yell about, uh, people that I don't like, like Elon Musk. So if you want to hear me get mad at and make fun of people who really deserve it, you will have a good time popping over to my stream. Um, so yeah, well, Zanzi, it's been wonderful. You have to head off now and I'm going to go talk about Chaz Chop. So, um, (laughs) 
All right. Well, have fun. Yeah. I, I'm going to send everyone in my audience over to yourself Yay. because that's a topic well worth learning about. Hell yeah. It's um, going to be real million, good. So. Not a bother. Thanks a million for having me on. Bye. Bye-bye. Hello. So how did everyone feel? Was that a good conversation? I feel like it was really good. I feel like I had a fucking...